is uh, Thursday, September 28th, uh, 2017, and the meeting is being broadcast by Milford Television. If anyone would like a copy of the broadcast, please feel free to reach out to a member of the administration or the, the school committee. Our first order of business tonight is the approval of minutes. There are several meeting minutes that have to be approved, so um, we're going to have to take these one at a, one at a time. Uh, the first is the minutes of the September 7th, 2017 regular school committee meeting. It looks like we were all in attendance. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Motion from Jim, seconded by Jen. Everyone in favor? All in favor? Uh, the next meeting minutes are from the uh, executive session held on October 20th, 2016. Joe, I don't believe you were at, at this meeting. Um, so one abstention and... Uh, do I have a motion? Actually, do I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from motion from Scott, seconded by Jim? All in favor? So four in favor, one abstention. Uh, the next executive session meeting minutes were from November 3rd, 2016. Uh, Joe and Scott were not in attendance that night. Um, so that we're going to have to pass on that one. Yeah. Um, so we'll, pa we'll pass on that for the next meeting. Uh, then we have the, meet the minutes of the March 30th, 2017 executive session. All were in attendance at that meeting. Do I have a motion to approve those meeting minutes? Motion from Joe, seconded by Scott. All in favor? Uh, the next minutes were from April 27th, 2017 executive session. All were in attendance as well. Do I have a motion to approve those meeting minutes? Motion from Jen, seconded by Jim. All in favor? Next meeting minutes were from May 4th, 2017, executive session. All were in attendance. Do I have a motion from Scott, seconded by Joe? All in favor? <coughs> Thank you. Next, we have the meeting minutes from the May 18th, 2017, executive session. Mike Walsh was not in attendance, but uh, the others were. Do I have a motion to approve those meeting minutes? Motion from Joe, seconded by Jen? All in favor? Uh, Next, we have the minutes of the June 8th, 2017 executive session. All were in attendance there as well. Do we have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from June 8th? A motion from Jim, seconded by Joe. All in favor? And then we have the minutes of the June 15th, 2017 executive session. Um, <coughs> Scott, John, and Mike were not in attendance. Um, so do I have a motion to approve? Motion from Jim, seconded by Jen. All in favor? So four in favor, one abstention for, for that one. All right, thank you. Uh, next order of business is announcements, correspondence, and distributions. Do we have any announcements, correspondence, or distributions? Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, actually, two things. One, it was actually um, just as it relates, as we're getting into football season, it's starting to get a little darker now. Um, I actually had a um, Detective Sergeant um, Kincaid from Milford Police Department actually reach out to me. Uh, he was walking um, after following the first home game from the football field. He was walking from the football field back to the school. Um, just brought it to my attention. It was extremely dark. Um, I know there's recently, just within the last week or so, we've had some clearing of some trees and some pullback of some of the shrubbery back there. Um, but just he brought it to our attention just from a, from a public safety perspective that there were some concerns around that. Um, just poor lighting. I know it's something that's been, you know, we've, we've talked about and added some lights. Um, I have walked it myself as well. It is still pretty dark going back there. In the interest of public safety, um, one thing I would like to add, Mr. Chairman, as we go forward on future agenda items is looking at as we get into this coming budget or potentially even looking at, at temporary lighting right now um, or what, if any, solutions we can come up with and be creative with uh, adding some lighting. Um, I, I don't think that's necessarily something that can, can wait depending on what the expenditures is, but I'd like to see if we can work forward with that, especially given that it's... Uh, member of the police department that brought it to our attention. Yeah, and, and that's something we've talked about in the mm -hmm. past with, with, with Rob as well. So if, if you wouldn't mind just circling back with him and maybe we can add yep, him absolutely. on as a future agenda item mm -hmm. uh, to talk through that because certainly the, the lighting needs to be improved and then the pathway itself is in mm -hmm. pretty rough shape. So yep. it, it's a bad combination, right? Yes. Um, so, so definitely something we want to look into. We can definitely do that. All right. Any, Jim? Actually, I'd like to echo what Scott said. So I walked it myself the last two. <laughs> Last two home games, and it's it's pretty bad. Mm. Um, can the, the visibility is almost zero, um, and if you're not using your phone for light, then you really can't see what's in front of you or who's walking towards you. So, I'll echo that definitely. All right. Any other announcements, or just one other, Mr. Chairman, if I may? Um, I got a phone call from a parent, um, and I I certainly hope this isn't the case, but it was a concerned parent that brought to my attention that um, that. Uh, 
at one of the elementary schools at Woodland that their that the football players were being told that they were not able to wear their uniforms to school. Um, I, I can't believe that to be the case. I, I certainly hope that's not the case, but it, it was something that was brought to my attention. Um, so I figured I would ask the question and ask that the yeah, administration just look into, into I, I it. Not heard that. The, the, feed, the, the reasoning behind it was that the students that were not playing football would feel bad that they were not able to wear a jersey to school. I, jerseys are, you know, certainly I would hope that something that's town related, drives school spirit, certainly well within dress code, certainly shouldn't be an issue. Um, if there's a question or a concern on that, I, I would certainly hope we can address that and, and get that out. It's, it's a great way to show school spirit, unifies the school, and, and uh, gives something for the kids. And I would invite each, each student, regardless of their sport, as long as it's within dress code, they want to wear them to school, they certainly should, whether it's Milford Hopedale Youth Soccer, their club team, um, as long as it's within dress code, you know, absolutely, they should be proud of the activities they participate in. That includes music and arts as well. I can, I can talk to Chairman about that. Great, thank you. Look into it. Any, Jen? I just wanted to mention, I think you mentioned it last time that you attended one of the technology um, information sessions about the Chromebooks. Yes. And um, I also had the opportunity to attend one of them, and um, I just wanted to compliment the tech team. It was very nicely done. Um, not only was it the tech team, but there was a classroom teacher there from Stacy who was able to talk about the use in the classroom, and she did a great job, and so did Matt. And um, I'm glad you're here tonight, too, Josh, because um, like clockwork, my freshman and my sixth grader came home with their Chromebooks on the day that they were told they were going to be coming home, and um, I think that's been an extraordinary amount of work, and the fact that it's all gone according to timeline and the kids have these devices in their hands um, is pretty exceptional. So thanks to everybody for your work with that. Great, thank you. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a great segue. Uh, and I just wanted to share with the committee that the Chromebook deployment at Stacy Middle School and Milford High School for ninth graders went very smoothly this week. Students were excited to receive the devices, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there are makeup days scheduled for students who did not complete and return their forms or were absent, so we've got a plan in place to take care of students that didn't receive them on the initial deployment. We're also very excited about the blended learning initiative. I want to thank the Milford School Committee, the Finance Committee, and the community for supporting this very important initiative. I think everybody's very excited about um, the Chromebooks being in the hands of students and the ability to take them home, both at the middle school and the high school. Any other announcements? No. All right, so mo moving on, our next uh, agenda item is invitation to speak. Is anyone here that would like to address the board? <coughs> no? All right, next order of business is Milford High School student update. <coughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Nathan Yon. I'm the president of the senior class at Milford High School. Um, so this past Monday, the freshmen received their Chromebooks. Um, they all love it. Uh, they've been using it a lot in the classes, and my brother's been doing most of his homework assignments on it. So I think it's <laughs> great reception to that so far. Um, the Global Citizenship Program um, inducted new members this past Wednesday. A uh, ceremony was held where Principal Otland spoke and current GCP members um, on the importance and continuance of a global community at MHS. Um, and it was a very beautiful ceremony. Um, the National Honor Society had a hurricane relief fundraiser that raised over $2,000 for the victims in Houston and Florida. Um, it was a great community event with a lot of support. Uh, Best Buddies had their first dance this last Friday with great student turnout, and it was a really fun time. So, <laughs> uh, The freshmen voted on their student council. So we have a full student leadership team, which is awesome. It's because leading into October, we have probably one of the busiest months from the student leadership perspective. Uh, we have our homecoming game, which the class of 87 football team will be honored, um, which is on the 13th of October. Uh, we have Spirit Week coming up, Pep Rally, and Harvest Dance, which is all the last week of October, so it's a pretty busy month. Uh, also, the Milford High School Theater Workshop is working hard in their fall drama, Alice in Wonderland, which will be showing on the 17th through 19th of November. And MHF Athlet Athletics are also performing well this fall with great student fan sections. I know everybody's been really pumped up about the athletics going on, so it's been a great start to school, so. Good. Any questions? Any questions for Nate? If I may, just real quickly. I, I apologize. I was trying to write it down here. Uh, Alice in Wonderland is what date? Uh, it's the 17th through 19th of November. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I, one of my asks would be is I know we do this with a lot of our sports groups and everything else. Uh, if we could invite the director and maybe a couple of the a couple of the performers to come in right beforehand as tickets go on sale, give an opportunity to get them. You know, we do uh, always do a great job with bringing in athletics, and certainly some of our art students. Maybe a good opportunity to help with the theater workshop as well. Yeah. 
and invite them to come in maybe at a meeting right around the time tickets go on sale. Um, so how's the senior year start? It's good. Okay. Well, once I apply to college, I'll be a little less stressed. But how is, how is your, <laughs> how's the students doing? We've got a lot of transition that's going on. Just kind of give us a feel of what, uh, what are you seeing out there? I think, a I'm not going to lie, I think everybody was a little nervous at first, but I think once and school started. And ignore that guy in the back of the room. <laughs> no, and I think a lot of people were a little bit nervous, but I think once school started, I honestly, everybody's loving their senior year. I've not heard good. a single complaint so far. So it's honestly been a very smooth transition over, and it's been awesome. I think everybody's really liking their senior year, which is good to hear, too. So. Good. Good. Any other questions for Nathan? No. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks no for problem. coming in. We always enjoy having you here. You're definitely someone who's making the most of their time here at Milford mm -hmm. High School. Uh, you've been so involved the last three years, and I know as a committee, we're looking forward to seeing what you're going to do your senior year mm -hmm. with you and your classmates are going to accomplish. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys so much. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. All right, uh, Josh, you are up, I believe. Uh, adjustments to the Milford High School Student Handbook. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to join you. Um, I'd certainly uh, echo your sentiments, Mr. Chairman. You should be excited to see what Nathan in the senior class is going to do this year, and I'm confident you will not be disappointed. Um, it's been a pleasure for me to get to know um, uh, a number of our student leaders uh, here in the opening weeks of school and, and a lot of our a lot of our students both in the classrooms and on the sports fields and you know as they're playing and performing and um, it's been a real real privilege and, and very very exciting to sort of open up the school year um, I wanted to speak to you this evening um, and ask for your support for making a couple of minor adjustments um, to the discipline code in our handbook um, you know, later in the school year, after our School Improvement Council has had an opportunity to uh, review handbook changes that are going to be proposed by a handbook committee um, that Rich Pierre Gustavo is chairing, I'll bring to you, I, I expect a number of requests for substantive changes to the handbook. But um, as I came in this summer, there's, a, there's uh, four specific items in the discipline code that caught my attention and that I would sort of respectfully ask for your uh, consideration of. Um, before I get to the specifics, one thing that I would like to share with you with regard to um, sort of the administration of discipline at the high school that I'm encouraged by and I hope you will be as well is that at the end of the first 15 days of school I ran some statistics to compare the first 15 days of this current school year versus the first 15 days of uh, the last school year and I'm very pleased to report that student tardies are down by 30 percent and teacher referrals for discipline are down by 45 percent um, so I hope this is just the start of, uh, of a long-term trend um, so that we can focus on uh, academics and extracurriculars and we're not distracted um, by these other issues. So specifically, uh, the first thing that I would like to ask for you to support a change on is the way in which um, the discipline code addresses class cuts. Um, as the code is currently states that the first offense will be a zero credit for class and teacher detention, um, the same for the uh, second offense and uh, effectively the same for the third offense. And if I could draw your attention to the chart at the bottom of your handout, you can see that class cuts um, was actually, a, in my analysis of the discipline data from last year, it was the single most um, cited re, uh, sort of discipline referral. Um, and you can see that there was over 900 instances of class cuts and there was 763 detentions issued for cutting class. That number suggests to me that detentions were a very ineffective response at modifying student behavior. Uh, I will just say based on my past experience as a school administrator, over 900 class cuts in a single school year um, was uh, very surprising to me um, and uh, not at all familiar to me based on my experience uh, as a school administrator for eight years prior uh, to coming here to Milford. So I would request that uh, we take a different approach, which is to assign students to Saturday school uh, when they're cutting class. For me, I think that cutting a class is a type of misconduct that we should respond to firmly. I think there's nothing more important than having our students in class. Uh, and I think that we've seen from the data that uh, a lighter touch approach was not effective at modifying student behavior. Um, the second request that I would make is uh, how we respond to students who fail to attend Saturday school. Uh, the discipline code states that these students will be assigned to in-school suspension. Uh, my concern about that is that in-school suspension, while well-intentioned, means that students miss yet more class time. Um, and I think in that respect, it can oftentimes be a counterproductive response. So I would propose that rather than having students miss yet more class time if they fail to attend Saturday school, that we in fact assign them to additional Saturday school sessions. 
um, as a logical consequence for missing Saturday school if they've not had a legitimate reason to do so. Um, thirdly is leaving school grounds. Um, as the discipline code is presently stated, um, for the first, uh, second, and third offense, it results in in-school suspension. Again, this means students missing more time out of class. Rather than having students miss time out of class, I would propose instead that they are assigned to Saturday school as a logical consequence for um, leaving school grounds without permission. Uh, and lastly is um, non-compliance with discipline call down. This is when, a, uh, this is when an assistant principal or, or one of our administrative assistants calls into a classroom and um, ask the teacher to send a student down to the office so that they can be seen by one of the administrators. Um, the first offense, uh, as the discipline code currently reads, is an office detention. Uh, and from my perspective as a school administrator, I think it's very important that we signal to our students that when an administrator requests their presence in the office, that this is really non-negotiable. Um, from my perspective, it's very dangerous to signal to students that failing to report to the office when requested to come by an administrator is essentially something that you know, if you don't do it, you get a little slap on the wrist of, of an office detention. Um, in my book, this is a fairly serious type of misconduct. We need, when we have requested that a student come down to speak to us, we need the student to come down and speak to us. Um, and if they're not doing so, I, I think that that makes it difficult for us to administer the school in a sort of controlled and orderly manner. So thank you for sort of hearing me out on that, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or address any concerns you might have about these proposals. Any questions for Josh? A couple. <clears throat> so first off, Josh, I'm 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 very pleased to hear. We'll start with I'm very pleased to hear about the the reduction in tardies as well as the the teacher referral for for disciplinary action. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, kind of I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll start with just kind of take one at a time here. So with class cuts, um, I do like the idea of kind of changing it from what effectively may be seen as from a student, especially given the number of students that spend so much time in the school afterwards anyways where an extra half an hour or 45 minutes after school may not be seen as quite the impact of cutting class. Um, Saturday school certainly brings a different a, a different feel to it. Um, so I, I certainly would be in support of that. I, I like the idea of it. Um, and the extension of time is really the difference between first and second. Mm -hmm. um, the open language for sort of you know, habitual offenders. Mm -hmm. um, do we? Are you defining habitual offenders as three times or greater? Uh, yes. Okay. I, I would say we may want to. It may be an opportunity to just draw that level of specificity to it, because mm -hmm. um, it only goes to two, and then just says habitual. Maybe move from. Um, it can change it to from a third offense and forward. Mm -hmm. We would constitute that as being a habitual offender. Mm -hmm. And will be subject to additional disciplinary action. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I do like that. I, I'm 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 certainly support that. The failure to attend Saturday school. I, I guess I just want to get your feedback on that. So if they fail to come, the where we're going to go. And I agree with you. Not taking them, taking them out of class is not helpful. That's not going to make our students more successful. Um, what's been your What's been your experience with? All right. So I didn't come to this Saturday school, and my uh, disciplinary action as a result is I've got to come back for something I skipped to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that the students then come back and do that? Or, I mean, what's your, what's so, your experience? So I, uh, I haven't worked in Milford long enough to sort of you know, talk to you about how it works here. In, have in you my, done it? No, have you yes, done this? Yes, so in my schools? prior professional experience, I think that it is, a, I, th I think that it is an effective consequence mm -hmm. um, at bringing about a change in student behavior. Uh, in my experience, uh, cutting Saturday school is a relatively rare um, occurrence. Uh, and I think that it can be made, um, I think it's rare if we do a good job communicating with families our expectations. But I think that oftentimes when students cut Saturday school, it's because there's been a failure to provide families with adequate notice okay. and to communicate effectively with families. And I think that with appropriate family communication, we can um, you know, eliminate altogether or have this be a very, very rare occurrence. How, we, how do we notify families when a student's um, been gifted with Saturday yeah. school. Uh, so I've, I've, I've told you know, our assistant principals that I expect them to call home, to speak okay. to the parents on the phone. Okay, good. Not just the phone, not, not just the voicemail. This is a, uh, you actually have to talk to them. Yeah, yeah. I want, to, I want there to be, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, Perfect. email has its place, but I think that when there's been a, um, when there's been an instance at school in which a student's failed to meet our behavioral expectations of a serious nature and we've assigned them to Saturday school, I think that warrants a discussion with, with the family. Okay. 
I no further questions. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. J Josh, who covers the Saturday school? Uh, so we employ a, a series of staff members who do it on a rotating basis. Okay. Um, so we have, I think, some of our administrative assistants are on that team. I think some of our security personnel are on the team. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any additional Saturday school sessions <coughs> if they fail to attend? Are you just going to leave that open-ended to the discretion of the administrator as to how many additional? Um, Sure, so I, I would say that as a general rule, if a student was assigned for an hour and a half and they failed to report for an hour and a half, that we would expect them to come for three hours the next time. So you know, we would consider sort of, um, you know, a Saturday school, a typical Saturday school session would be for one and a half hours, although it's staff from eight to 11, right? And so that, you know, we would assign one and a half hours for certain types of misconduct, like say cutting a class, um, more sort of, you know, uh, serious types of misconduct, we might assign for three hours of Saturday school. So if a student was assigned for an hour and a half and they missed it and they had no legitimate reason why, we would expect them to come for three hours the next week. Okay. All right. And this is really only a change for the, the handbook. Do we have to evaluate the policy on discipline as well in any way? No, just, just, just the handbook. handbook. Okay. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I agree with what's been said already, um, and I, I think it makes sense. It, it really does. Um, my question, to kind of Scott's question, or whoever asked about the parental notification, mm -hmm. because it was in previously, can that be added into the proposed that um, with with there'll be a first defense Saturday school with parental notification? That way, it's clear to parents when they read this that they know that if that were to happen, they would get that notice. I just think it makes it more clear from the parent perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then my second question just had to do with. Um, for the discipline call down, mm -hmm. so the consequence for that is suspension. I was just wondering the rationale for mm -hmm. a suspension versus a Saturday school for that one. Right. So I think you know, from my perspective, this is a. Um, I, th I think that we need to signal to students very strongly that this is totally off limits conduct. Mm -hmm. um, that when you're called down to the office to speak to an administrator, you must come down to the office <coughs> to speak to an administrator. Um, and so, um, I think that if it's not responded to in a firm manner when that behavior happens uh, my fear is that it will fester um, and uh, I think it's really fr from my perspective I think it's imperative for the orderly management of a school that when an administrator asks a student to come down to speak to them that that they simply come um, I think it's a very reasonable request and mm -hmm. I don't know that there's ever a reason why a student would be justified in not coming down to the office to speak to an administrator when they've been asked to come so for that reason I think a, a fairly firm response is warranted so, so you see a suspension as a more significant response than a Saturday school in that, and more in line with the events? Yes. Yeah, so, I, you know, uh, for me, the sort of the, the continuum of consequences yeah. for misconduct would start with a warning, yeah. and then move to a detention, yeah. and then a Saturday school, and then a suspension. Uh, and then my last question is, mm -hmm. so how will the changes be uh, communicated to students? Right. So, um, I Not would that they should have to, because I think they... They should be doing all the all the right things anyway. Yeah, but yeah. I so they, I would I would sort know. of I would communicate it out to families. Okay. Um, first of all, in one of my sort of family updates, okay. and I would uh, I would provide a sort of a you know written letter to students that we were distributing yeah. in homeroom. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your work on this. You're welcome. Thank you. I just can I yeah. one quick question? Please, uh, Josh. Just one <laughs> last thing. Yep. Um, so it's, it was no secret the first time I met you that the uh, metrics that you brought to your interview were impressive and. Um, I love the fact that you're, you're, you're using metrics to drive decision making within the district. So the only ask that I, I have, and if you've sent this out, I apologize, mm -hmm. I didn't see it. If you're building these metrics on a regular basis, is there any way you could continue to share that with the committee? Because I myself mm -hmm. would be interested in seeing that, whether it comes out weekly, bi-monthly, however mm -hmm. you do it. Sure. Um, and even if, uh, dare I say, we go as far as to have some type of dashboarding, um, I'd be in favor of seeing a variety of metrics mm -hmm. um, in performance or non-performance um, across the district. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in the high school. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Absolutely. All right, so I believe this requires a, a vote. Yep. Um, so with pleasure, Mr. Chairman, I, I certainly motion uh, with the proposed change of the on the cost cuts that we move it to, a, that would just indicate there that it's a third offense and then con constitutes habitual offenders. Uh, I make a motion that we accept the proposed changes with that one amendment. The um, add two. parental notification. Mm -hmm. Parental notification and class cuts, yes, I apologize. Yep, to incorporate Jen's, Jen's feedback Can I well. just make a quick <coughs> comment on, on sort of parental notification? Um, 
So uh, I am happy to sort of mm -hmm. amend it in that way. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that elsewhere in the discipline code, where uh, it notes Saturday school as a consequence, it mm -hmm. would not sort of be accompanied by parental notification. So we could certainly make that amendment, but I also just want to reassure both the committee and the public that that will be our custom and our practice, that any time mm -hmm. a student is assigned to Saturday school, there will be a, a phone call made home. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be futile if you didn't because they could go to their friends and Saturday school's over and we're all set. So I don't know if there's a different way, maybe in the next handbook, that that's just kind of a blanket statement and then it would prevent you from having to write it every single yes. time. But, I think yeah. that's what Josh is saying, though, is when it lists, when it oh, outlines, it when it outlines Saturday school in the handbook, somewhere? it says Saturday school will, be, will require parent notification. It says that already in the handbook. Was, is that correct? No, uh, so I, I don't believe that. it does. What I'm saying oh, is I thought that it so, already did. So, the, so our handbook, to be candid with you, in my experience, is a bit atypical in the way that high school handbooks are written in the region. Uh, in my experience researching handbooks, you typically do not see a multi-page enumerated list of all possible infractions with sort of consequences <coughs> laid out. Um, it's typically a much sort of kind of broader statement of a principled approach to sort of the continuum of consequences and how they will be administered. So in the handbook as it's currently written, you have <coughs> Saturday school articulated as a consequence for many different types of misconduct. But where it says that Saturday school will be issued, it doesn't say that necessarily parents are going mm -hmm. to be notified. So while in these particular enumerated items, we could certainly add parental notification, mm -hmm. um, I think it, it maybe for efficiency's sake, true. it might be more appropriate to amend sort of the preamble to the disciplinary section or um, you know, some other means by which to sort of communicate that expectation. Again, this is a little bit kind of legalistic um, in terms of how it appears in the handbook, I want to assure the committee that this will be our practice, regardless of the type of discipline, that if a student's assigned to Saturday school, we will be calling home and communicating with families. Right. So, I maintain my motion. Okay, so mo motion from Scott to um, approve the, the revised discipline code with the one amendment that uh, states three or more infractions. Um, do we have a second? Second from Jim. All in favor? All in favor? Yep. Um, and then you'll address the other item as part of the handbook at a future. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for your Perfect. support. Thank, thank you, Josh. Josh. Thank you, Josh. On a side note, Josh, we're hearing I'm getting lots, lots of great feedback from parents, teachers, um, community members, students as well. So, uh, off to a great start. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have the summer lunch program next. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We can we can pull up two more chairs too to the table. I got two. Nobody's gonna sit. I'm gonna start gonna take a chair. There we go. Director of Community Wellness at the Hockamock Area YMCA, and we are one of the three pillars that really join forces to make the summer lunch program happen. And I'm joined here by my colleagues from the Milford Area Humanitarian Coalition, Mike Kaplan and Justin Bartarijan, who can give a little bit of history on how the program started and some of the great work that the coalition does all year round. And then my colleague Shannon Nisbet down on the end, who will talk to you a little bit about our student involvement and the great teen volunteers that we had this summer. And of course, you all know fabulous Carla Tuttle, without whom none of this is possible. So we will be singing her praises throughout this presentation. So thank you again for having us. And Mike? Okay, well, uh, thank you all for allowing us to uh, come here. But uh, thank you all for allowing us to uh, use the facilities that you have and the resources that you have, Carla, the schools. We can't do this unless you folks sign off, kind of give us a stamp of approval. Let us show you that what we can bring to the table. The Milford Area Humanitarian Coalition was formed a little over three years ago. It encompasses a number of local organizations, including the Rotary, uh, Salvation Army, Trinity Church, the UU Church, SMOC, um, we've had Senator 
uh, Ryan Fatman's come in, and of course Representative Murray, and a number of other groups and organizations. We were formed so we could utilize, we really coordinate our efforts. Instead of one church or the Rotary doing one thing, we all kind of wanted to pool our resources together to say, you know something, instead of you putting on a dinner one night or you doing a clothing drive on this, maybe we can all kind of get together and see what does the community really need? What are the, what are the real needs of our community? And so out of all of that, we, we addressed four particular points that we were concerned when we first set out. And that was transportation, which now there is transportation. We do have a bus system going on. And I, I, I'll uh, give great credit to the town and Harold Rhodes and others who assisted in getting that done. Harold also sits on the humanitarian uh, coalition, so that's great. One was food security or meals, if you will. That was one of our other issues. Uh, the third was addressing issues with our um, elderly or our seniors in the area, if there's anything we could do to assist them. And one was information dissemination. How can we let people know in our community what is available for resources to them? So the first thing that we did is um, we incorporated and then uh, I formed a summer lunch committee, which. Uh, Dave Scott was the first one to join in, and Justin, and this is preceding the Hockamock YMCA, and uh, at one point we were talking about making lunches in my conference room and distributing them. That didn't really seem to be a real, you know, legitimate way of accomplishing the task. We saw all sorts of, you know, faux pas or issues with that. And finally, we said, you know something, we're going to go out and we're going to try to raise some funds and try to help some students who during the summer, because approximately 44% of students receive a summer lunch or subsidized program. So what do the students do during the during the non-school program year, the, the summer, right? So we the Rotary was the first one involved, you know, me being the past president of Rotary, I'm rah, rah, Rotary and everything, but good for them to say, you know, here's some money to get going, kind of gave us some credibility to go to the other organizations, other banks, Unibank, Milford Fed, Milford National, really a lot, you know, Carl Bright Insurance, a lot of good organizations and groups in our community came together, donated money. We did a pilot program uh, three years back. And we served a couple thousand meals, and we said to ourselves, you know something, there really is a need in our community. This is not a need that the coalition itself can do, really. So teaming up with partners like the Hockamock YMCA, how Father Mac was able to coordinate that, I don't know, but it's been, I'll use the vernacular, a blessing, so yeah. to speak, because having them involved has allowed us um, to grow the program through having staff that we we all have jobs and so the YMCA now has time to allow us to go and obtain people like Shannon. Shannon was a site uh, a supervisor for all of the different sites that we had and coordinated over a hundred people and volunteers and and did all of this so we could make sure that the right food was at the right place. Carla on the other hand she is just tremendous and we already know that and, and to have the ability to have someone who can order food, then prepare the you've food. You've got an agent, Carla. <laughs> 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 uh, 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 what? Negotiate my contract. <laughs> <laughs> Your timing's off. All right, so yes. you know, to order the food, yeah. prepare the food, and to distribute the food, and keep the food at a certain temperature, because there's all sorts of rules and regulations with respect to this, is extremely important. So to have the YMCA that can come in and then say, you know something, this is a great food program. Let us help you grow the program. Let us look for some grants. Let us look for some volunteers. Let us help train you. It, it's been phenomenal. Then we, we developed the activities that go along with the lunch program. I know, Joe, that you were at one of the, um, the meetings where uh, Congressman Joe Kennedy came down and was serving meals. You can see the kids interacting. There were, there were activities. It's just not a lunch. Okay, it's developed, it's, it's, morphing, it's morphing into something much bigger than that. So the kids are engaged, they like being there, they're playing games. It's a really tremendous activity. Could never have done it without Mary Kate and Shannon from the YMCA. Certainly can't do it without you folks approving and allowing and having Carla assist us as well. It, it, it's the partnerships, like, she, like Mary Kate said, it is three pillars and it really is great to see our community organizations coming together along with folks like uh, the YMCA and 
uh, Carla Tuttle. Now, of course, I'm an attorney and I get paid by the hour, so this is why I've talked so long. <laughs> so maybe I should let someone else speak. Uh, but I, I do want to thank you again. I truly do, because each and one of you has allowed us the opportunity to give back to the community. We recognize the need, and hopefully you'll allow us to do this again in, in the future. And just to echo some of Mike's comments, we are so appreciative to all of you, I mean, Kevin and Craig and Kathleen from the beginning. There was you know, no barriers, no questions asked. You all just said, how can we help and how can we make this possible? So we're eternally grateful for that, allowing us <coughs> to do what we've been able to do over the past three years now. And you have a one pager with the summary of the data from this summer. So as you can see, 9,500 meals, which is 3,000 or so more than last summer. So it's really exciting for us to see this growing slowly but surely and we're able to add breakfast this year for the Woodland Summer School Program with Carla's help. Again, no questions asked. She said, what do you need? I'll do it. And it was fabulous. So all of those students got to have both a breakfast and a lunch throughout that program, which is really exciting. And we'd also love to share a little bit about the students from Milford Public Schools, high school and middle school who made such a difference for us. So I'd love, Shannon, if you could just share a little bit about that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, Milford Public Schools had excellent representation by your students and some of your staff in the program this summer. Um, there were uh, six teachers, two school nurses, and one retired teacher from Milford Public Schools who volunteered at our open sites. Um, several Milford teens were dedicated throughout the summer. Tonight, we'd like to recognize the teens who volunteered um, for 35 hours or more for the entire summer. Two of them could not be with us tonight, including Jennifer Wong, who's a high school student, and Sabrina Oliveira, who's in seventh grade at Stacy Middle School. Um, however, we are very excited to have two of them with us tonight. If you would like to come down. We have Kiara Farias and Chris Dielli, uh, Prado here tonight with us. Um, these two young ladies were um, exemplary volunteers. They pretty much ran the activity program at Memorial Elementary School, um, volunteering uh, three to four days a week. Um, Kiara volunteered a total of 36 hours over the summer, and that was even starting later in uh, around the third week when she found out about the program. And Chris Dielli joined us for the second summer in a row, and she volunteered for a total of 70 hours. Wow. So, wow. Uh, both of these young ladies took excellent initiative each and every time they were there. They welcomed um, new teen volunteers into the program, um, interacted with the visiting kids and families. I just can't say um, enough wonderful things about them. They're also um, very involved in the schools. Uh, Christy Ellie's on the soccer and track team and participates in seven different clubs. <laughs> and Kiara is also um, participates in indoor and outdoor track and is volunteers for the Best Buddies uh, Club, and another one as well, I believe. So, um, would, anything you'd like to say? Um, I just think this was a really great opportunity. Um, I'm glad that I got into it and was able to, uh, you know, uh, get into the community and know more people, and it's very fun. Mm -hmm. sure. Adding to that, like, I would, for the second year, I had, like, the best experience I could ever have, like, um, returning like people like that I met like the first year and then like just having a relationship with them and like getting to know like a day fair would come in there were like about like 30 of them I knew them their names their sisters their brothers <laughs> I knew their whole life so I actually like got to like interact with them like to that point you know so it's great building a relationship with the community well thank you both so much for your service and for coming so, so before they before they go, we've got yes. a small token of appreciation. Don't yeah, we just have a few oh. gifts. Uh, thank you very much for, for getting involved and uh, participating in all, all the activities that you're involved in. So we have some Milford High pop sockets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's okay. <laughs>
just get out of practice? <laughs> yeah, I just think. I just, um, you know, it's, it's been a great community partnership. And uh, to set those record straight, I just, you know, I couldn't do my job unless I had the staff to do it. So I had staff at Memorial, Woodland, and at the high school. And um, they're, the, they're the real heroes of the program, not me. They do the work every day. I just make sure they have the stuff they need and they get it all done. And our, and our drivers this summer, uh, Daga and, and, uh, and Tony, uh, getting the lunches there on time uh, with some few time constraints and parking <laughs> issues at, at the new Trinity Center, but everything worked out well. And like I said, it's a community effort with all of us, and it's, it's a great to be very proud to be with these people to, to help this uh, program <coughs> grow. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, I have a meeting next week. I didn't tell them, I, but with uh, Josh Troutwine, he's a Milford High graduate who does the uh, fresh truck. So you might see a Milford bus somewhere along the line coming, <laughs> you know, if we can get that going, Kevin, so. As you know, that's Craig's dream. Yeah, so uh, we have a few things in the works and maybe a food truck too, right? Absolutely. <laughs> if it's food, I'm in. Okay, Absolutely. So we want to go to neighborhood to neighborhood if we can in the future. Wow, that's a so great idea. That would be great. I, I just want to add one thing. At the end of the summer lunch program, uh, how many backpacks were there? Well over 100, 130. Over 130 backpacks were distributed to, to kids filled with school supplies and things like that, which, again, it was their idea. They asked for some contribution. I, it's just a fantastic thing, and thank you again for allowing us to do it. Okay. Any questions or comments before we let them? If I can, go? just for a quick second. So first off, um, I, I can't believe you're thanking us, to be honest. Um, we should be thanking you. I can't believe the amount of work that you guys do for our kids. Um, it's awesome. The, um, a couple of quick questions I just have. I, I know it's certainly something that's amazing during the summer. It's been a sort of a, a meal replacement for a lot of our students who are on this. Um, is there already in place, and it's, it's more of a question, um, and if not, is there a thought to possibly continuing this on through weekends during the school year? Um, knowing that the kids Monday through Friday were able to help them during that, is that something that's even as, as a look forward, just knowing that there's two days a week now on a long weekend, perhaps even more? I, I can tell you from the coalition standpoint and, and the summer lunch standpoint, <coughs> when we have our meetings, we do talk about not just the fact that it's a Monday through Friday program, but what happens when the kids go home on Friday yeah. and then you have Saturday and Sunday. And so we've been grappling with this idea. And so it isn't something that his, his, we have a thought about it's a very difficult issue because you run into more issues for volunteers on a weekend than you are going to run into in my opinion on a Monday through Friday you know people you know after the work week they want to go away they want to do things uh, so there's some challenges with coordination of some efforts the schools are open typically you know Monday through Friday and, and I don't know how they would be open or not on the weekend so the logistics becomes um, uh, not daunting it's just it's just challenging and so we'd certainly be willing to you know discuss that to see if there was a way that we could put in uh, a program in place but we have to be realistic as well uh, there will be challenges, but each time you, uh, you, you know, you take on that challenge, you find out where you didn't go well, and we improve upon that the next year, and I think we could do that again. Well, I also think financially it would be very difficult for us to swing that. Yeah, that, that, that's a separate issue, that the finances. Thank you, Justin. Justin is the Milford Area Humanitarian Coalition's treasurer. So, uh, so that's, why, so, that's why you're getting that comment. It was reminding me as vice president, hey, Mr. Vice President, you know, uh, we have a finance issue. I got it. So, uh, I, we, we, we wouldn't be able to put this program on if it wasn't being subsidized by the Department of Agriculture. And there are very strict guidelines in how we have to run that if we are to maintain that that subsidy, I, I'd be interested to see though if we can if that's something that you know it, it could be explored a little bit further. I'm I'm happy to help partner with you guys on that. Sure. Um, one source of volunteers just to toss out to you: um, every bank in the United States has the volunteer hours to maintain their Community Reinvestment Act. We have 
about eight different banks in town. That's not just the local ones. Bank of America has to do it. Santander has to do it. TD Bank North has to do it. Citizens, have, every single bank that's chartered in the United States has to maintain a certain number of volunteer hours, and that includes all of their colleagues that work in the towns. They have to volunteer within their communities that they actually maintain an office in. So that's every bank. I'm a banker. So, <laughs> so I appreciate the budget conversation. Um, there's a number of different organizations that are out there, so I think volunteers actually may be a different group too. National Honor Society, the Cub Scouts, the Girl Scouts, certainly. Um, I know we've got a lot of people, so if it's something, I'd certainly be happy to you know, help participate if that's something that you guys are, would consider looking into as we look throughout the school year. I think about school vacations too. Um, most of our school buildings, this one certainly, no, no, as Carla can attest to and anyone else in this room, uh, is in service about 23 hours a day. Um, there's always something going on here. It's, a, it's amazing. Um, we also had thought, I'm sorry to interrupt, Scott, mm. about giving meals that could be cooked um, on the weekends. But the problem became, in my opinion, that there's so many strict guidelines about what we're able to give out and not give out without jeopardizing, as already said, the, the, what we're able to achieve through the subsidy. Um, but we are going to keep looking into that. I'm glad that you're willing to, to, Happy to chime in. That's great. Happy to help on that. And there's a lot going on in terms of the concept, for example, around school-based food pantries, where there's some type of discrete operation within a school, mm -hmm. nurse's office, principal's office, where there is some type of storage that gets sent out discreetly over the <coughs> weekend. And that's something that we as the Y would love to, to further explore if maybe there's something we can do around that. The USDA piece definitely applies in the summer, but we're not as bound by those rules in any effort that we do during the school year. So I think it's something we should definitely continue to, to talk about. That'd be great. great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> thank you. Yeah. So yeah, th thank you for, for everything you, you've done over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, Mike, this, this doesn't happen without um, the, the coalition and, and taking the, the initiative and having the vision for this. So we really appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, and Mary Kate and Carla, you know, getting the Y involved and getting the, the school district involved ensures that this is sustainable, right? And that we can continue to do this year over year going forward. So really appreciate your involvement in this as well. So th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next agenda item is the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey. What's that? Do we have hey, come on up. up. Kevin? You What's the presentation? I can, I can pull it up there for you. <laughs> if you want to start, introduce yourselves. I can try to pull it up. Sorry, Kevin. Give me one second. And Judy, while we're getting set up, thank you for sharing the uh, 2014 data with me. I brought the manuals back. Okay. Put them over oh, there. Okay. So if you want to, I can bring them to the central office and you can oh, pick them up okay. there. I'll take them all okay. I just want to introduce who's here with us tonight. Amy Leone, who is the owner of Community Impact Counseling Services. Lisa White, our wellness nurse. And everyone knows Lucy Jenkins, our special education director. And I'm Judy Daggies, um, director of nursing. So before we present this year's data, I wanted to provide some background about the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey. Since 2006, the survey has been administered every other year in community service by the Metro West Health Foundation with the goal of supporting data-driven improvements in health programs and policies at the local and regional level. Student participation is voluntary and confidential and parents are given the choice to opt their student out. In 2016, over 40,000 students from 26 school districts in grades 7 through 12 participated in the survey providing important adolescent trend health data in the areas of substance abuse, violence, bullying, mental health, sexual behavior, and physical health. This data has and will continue to greatly enhance school and community efforts to improve adolescent physical, mental, and emotional well-being. So I think Amy is ready to yeah, sorry. share some information. <laughs> um, so I was, um, started doing this work in 2005 and was lucky enough to be at the very beginning of this data being <clears throat> um, correlated with the Metro West Foundation. So it's been really exciting to see all of it, you know, 
the trends from 2006 all the way now to 2016. So what we're going to present today is really just an overview of the key indicators just <coughs> from our specific district. And as you look through, you know, you can see the binders are very big and there's a lot of data in there and you can really sift through it and figure out when there's a question, you know, what kind of really dug into that. Um, so what we will show you tonight is probably the most valuable um, slides that we could highlight the data of what we are seeing in comparison to the grades um, between Milford, the 7th and 8th, going from, you know, 9th all the way to 12th. And then also looking at where do we compare with the region and then Massachusetts and then nationally. Um, so when you see these, it's, you know, I think there's a handout, handout that we illustrated some of the more specifics from what you're seeing on the slides. Um, and just to show you that, you know, a lot of what we have done over the last, you know, since 2006, all of our initiatives have been driven from the need of what we've seen. So, and this has been a collaborative effort of the JAG group, um, the school system, the Board of Health, um, you know, just everybody coming together and really working together. Um, so while I was sitting back and I think I read into a lot of this data and probably got myself more worked up about the data that I was seeing, whether it was excitement or just nerves of what we needed to do or what, what we've already accomplished together, um, I really sat back and thought about, you know, what this period of adolescence is. And that's not only as a therapist, but as a parent and, you know, all as teachers and administrators and everybody. And just kind of thinking about what a hard time that is for an adolescent. And, you know, I think back to, you know, thankfully many things, you know, the threats that our children are having right now, you know, thankfully it's not, doesn't have to do a lot with, you know, disease and chronic conditions, but right now what we're dealing with and what I see on a um, daily basis is, you know, that accidental injury and the risky behaviors that are out there and that they're really engaging in. And that's what we look at when we look at this data. Um, as my experience and over the years, just kind of that, that these years are that high stress and, you know, they're trying to learn who they are you know, while at the same time they're all confronted by the pressures of being an adolescent and just trying to fit in. And, you know, it's we all were adolescents at one time and this time is really harder than it was when we were younger. Um, so when I was looking at the data, um, which we'll start to show you, it was, it was really interesting to start to, um, one of the things that we looked at is the other communities, as Judy said, that were surveyed in Metro West. Are you on a specific slide? Here? No, I'm just kind of just uh, talking. Uh, just like <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, um, you know, looking at those communities that are there and how we are so different from many of the other communities that were surveyed. And we were thinking about, you know, there's a question that you'll see when it comes to like stress. And you'll see that that is a big thing that, you know, stress is a big is a high area and when we think about where and we just saw 9,000 meals that you know were given over the summer our kids are stressed about yes academics getting into college but also where's their next meal gonna come from you know is their mom dad sister brother gonna even come home safely are they gonna have a place to sleep a jacket boots all of those things so as we really look at this you know that was what I was thinking of even like who get, they get so stressed out about how late is the library open so that I can use a computer to do my homework that I need to do for school. Now they have Chromebooks, but do they have internet? Do they need to go to Dunkin' Donuts? You know, so as we look at this, I just want you to, you know, take into account the kids that are surveyed and then where we are and that these are just the key indicators because there is so much more data in it. Um, so as we um, go to the first slide, Oh, sorry, that's um, that's the handout that everybody has. Yeah, because I think it's the PowerPoint presentation. You ha you had it that the first attachment right there, and then just do open with or it should be open with slides. Yeah, I did it originally in Google Slides. Okay. 
We hope so. <laughs> uh, but just to, and I could just kind of go through as we, because I know you have a lot of stuff on the agenda. So. And Amy, I don't think we have the, the handout. Yeah, we don't have the PowerPoint. Oh, I don't think you have that. Do you yeah, have the handouts? We do. Um, we do. It's this one. These two? No, we don't have those. No, we don't have those two. Okay, so we'll make sure that we get you those. Um, So when we first started, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you want me to just talk? I would just yeah. talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can do that um, instead of just watch a screen. So anyways, um, when we started, so the first thing that we worked. Yeah, that's the presentation. The presentation is okay. just let her do it. Actually. Yeah, I think Lisa should jump in there. Since Scott pushed me off all of this, go take care of it. <laughs> no, I think we're good. It's just it's not, not going to continue. That's why it's not going to Okay, so, um, so when we, when we yeah. started, this is, this is the middle school data, and so that's 7th and 8th grade. So when we look at it, um, in 2016, there was 519 kids who were surveyed from seventh and eighth grade. So as of when I, we started this initiative when originally funded to get these surveys done in 2006, substance abuse was really the big thing that we addressed in regards to prevention. And so as you can see this slide, well you can't really see it, but um, the slide shows that we looked at the ever drank alcohol in a lifetime. And when we had first started in 2006, it was at 28%, now it's down to 17%. So we have seen a strict decline throughout the last 12 years, or 10 years, sorry. Um, when we look at marijuana use, there is definitely, there's a decline from 6% now today to 3%. Um, I did in there add the misuse of prescription drugs. Um, it does not include heroin, but it is just prescription drugs that were not prescribed to you. Um, any of them and so it was 1% now we're at 2% um, so that's you know an area I think with the education and everything you know we may see that decline a little bit now coming into you know the next time we do it um, the other area which is a great decline um, is the inhalant use because usually with younger kids in seventh and eighth grade you see more of their experimentation with inhalants and we went from 9% to 3% now in 2012 which is excellent. Um, we also looked at um, the trends in violence because as we know over the years we have you know, had the bullying policies and we've changed all of that. And so what we surveyed here was looking at bullying victims over the past 12 months, so within this, that year, so it was kind of a cross between two school years. Um, and then victims on school property and then as a perpetrator and then being a perpetrator on school property to really look at that. Um, and you could see where we have, you know, in 2006 they did not ask about the perpetrators, um, but as time went on and we all became more knowledgeable and the bullying laws, um, we did have a decline um, in, we had less, I think there was more education, if, from 2014 to 2016 to what actually is a perpetrator um, because you see in 2014 there's only you know six percent and four percent I don't know if kids really knew what that was because we were starting to really educate them on all of these things um, so there is a little bit of an increase as we get into 2016 but can decrease just, in the bullying. Can you just give us what those numbers, we can't see it. Yeah, so can you just in, give us what those numbers are? Um, so in 2014, when looking at the perpetrators, um, one being a bullying perpetrator, it was 6%, and then a bullying perpetrator on school was 4%. Two years later, it rose to 11% and 8%. Um, and so we could, one of the things that, you know, could be the education, but also one of the things that we were talking amongst ourselves <clears throat> as we were reviewing a lot of the data was, what is the perception? 
you know, what is the perception of the kids, the school, you know, everything, and trying to understand is, you know, what does that violence mean? What does it mean to them when they see, is it fooling around, is it, you know, aggressive actions, all of that stuff. So it really sparked up a conversation um, for us to really look at maybe doing some focus groups to understand what the kids actually understand and what the faculty and the community says as, you know, what is violence, what is posturing, what is, you know, bullying behaviors, what do they perceive that as? And this, um, was the, if I could jump in, mm -hmm. this was the one place we really couldn't triangulate the data. All the other pieces kind of made sense with what we were seeing kind of on the school day to day. But like, like for example, the suspension data didn't align with what was being reported in some cases mm -hmm. in terms of the violence piece. So we're gonna really look at that. Um, and it was, it was a, big conversation to really look at that, that that's an area that we will definitely be digging into. Um, you know, we did see, um, you know, we've all learned that these are times of stress. Um, and so one of the things a few years, um, three years ago, we had an initiative with um, the Metro West Healthcare Foundation to address the mental health and suicidality of adolescents. And, you know, we had a grant that supported that. And so we looked again here at our data of, you know, where are we in regards to Milford and Metro West? Um, and as you can see, you know, in some areas, you know, we're a little bit higher, but we're, we're close, you know, um, and this data is, you know, life is very stressful over the past 30 days, um, being at 15% for Milford, um, and then seriously considered um, attempting suicide in their lifetime was 15%. Um, hurt or injured yourself on purpose um, within the past 12 months was 10% and made a plan about attempting suicide in your lifetime was 11%. So it is definitely um, still an area that we, you know, obviously are working on. And I think that's where, you know, as we talk about all the collaboration and we see that, that, you know, with working with the SEL and, you know, working with the health teachers and the guidance staff and the school psychologists and, you know, Lisa as a wellness nurse and everything that we're really putting that into practice of figuring out what do we need to do to address that stress and, you know, um, what we can do. And I think, you know, and you'll hear more from Lucy about what's happening, you know, on the preventative side of that, because the most important piece is that we are working in prevention because right now we have these kids that are in seventh and eighth grade, but the reality is we want to see these numbers decline and the only way we can do that is if we start at a very young age um, so that we see that. Um, this is always, you know, I think many as a therapist, um, I see a lot of kids, you know, they come in and they say they have anxiety, they have all these things, they label themselves with what they have. So we really looked at, um, you know, symptoms of being stressed, anxious, and worried, because we do see a lot of our kids being stressed, anxious, and worried for various reasons. Um, and so we looked at, um, this is the difference between seventh and eighth grade, just to see that trend of where is the stress happening, what's going on. Um, you know, we see that there's a small change, you know, more, you know, not having pleasure in some things, being maybe some symptoms of depression as they get into eighth grade. Also keeping into account you know, they're going through that change, you know, their adolescence, their puberty, all of those things. Um, you know, we see a lot of kids that are having trouble falling asleep, staying asleep. Goes back to that social media, where's that phone? Are they off the phone? You know, all that stuff. Um, you know, felt bad about themselves or that they were a failure. I think one of the things that we're seeing across the line now is that a lot of kids that perfectionist, you know, they put so much pressure, it may not be the parents that are putting their pressure on them, but their own pressure they're putting on internally to be perfect and they're, you know, perfect is boring is what I always say to them. So, you know, you do see that rise as they get into eighth grade. Um, and then just weary, uh, worrying and feeling stressed about their appearance. I mean, that is definitely, from running my practice, we have had a huge increase in students who are, clients who have eating disorders, you know, starting from a young age and really trying to work with that. So we have seen a lot of that increase as well. Um, and that's not just in Milford, our clients come from all over. Um, 
and to just kind of give, I think there's always, it's always important to give our protective factors because that is all the things that we are doing well with. Um, and so, you know, I think at state, you know, this is Stacy, and I think you also have to remember that in 2016, they were in two different schools, right? Yeah, Latin. so seventh and eighth was in two different schools. So this is looking at East and Stacy. Um, you know, feeling close to people at school. I mean, we're, you know, in the 70s percentile. Um, feeling safe, you know, our kids are feeling safe and, you know, there's at least one adult that they can talk to if they have a problem and then talk to, to an adult about a personal problem. Um, you know, is a little bit lower, but it's definitely, when you look at these, um, you know, this is an overview again, there's different <laughs> dimensions of each of the problems that goes into, like even the stressed factor, it goes into what are you actually feeling stressed about? Your family, appearance, school, safety, you know, it really breaks it down. Um, so once again, these are overviews. Can I stop for just one yeah, second? Yeah, sure. Question. So, so <laughs> two years ago, you guys came in and did a very similar presentation and thank you guys for all the work that you've done. So Kevin, I'm gonna just talk a little bit real, real quickly here was something that jumped out last time mm -hmm. as well. And it's that second question. It's the I feel safe in school. Um, that's the combination of agree and strongly agree answers. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm reading yeah, the data it correctly. Is. So 77% of our student population in our seventh and eighth graders say that they either agree or strongly agree that they feel safe in school, mm -hmm. which is great. However, the other side of that coin is that means we've got 23% of our student population saying that they, either they, so, saying something other than they agree or strongly agree. What are the other answer choices? But there, was, uh, there wasn't any other answer choices. And so that went into our big conversation of the interpretation of what it is. Because right. we get, got into that with like <laughs> violence and weapons and you know, these types of things. So that is another thing that when we were talking about kind of doing like, you know, focus groups of yeah. trying to figure out is what does that I feel safe mean? Or what does it not mean, you right. know? Um, because I think that is something, because it did come up and we were looking at well, that and you know, it's saying, all right, what are we missing? And that's when we really dove into what is all of this other stuff, pulling up, you know, different records and stuff, so. Yeah. And, um, and two years ago, we were in the wake, just to level set for anybody that may be watching as well. It was in the wake of, uh, I believe it was not too far removed from Newtown. There were a number of other, right school violence issues that have gone on, some school shootings were much more prevalent in the news than they are right now, yep. thankfully, and hopefully that continues on that trend. Um, is that number about the same? It was, um, actually, it, a, it was lower. Okay. It was lower so, than it was um, so now. It's, it's definitely improved, yeah. so we're seeing an improvement. You, uh, and I'm not, if you don't remember off the top of your head, I don't, I don't blame you, it was two years ago. But, I don't remember exactly that's okay. what it was. I'm happy to see that that continues to rise. I think certainly media is gonna play a role in that. What did you uncover when you sort of, you know, peeled the onion a little bit there with with having some of those focus groups? Uh, well, that's what we're gonna do, that's our oh, plan. That's plan. Yeah, well. so after our discussion of going through this, you know, it was kind of, Lisa and I were meeting, and I was like, I think we need to like pull together and really brainstorm this. So. Um, that is something that we're all going to work with the health teachers and really, you know, come together to figure out how do we do this focus group and make it the most effective so we can fully understand the areas that we need to work on. Or if we're already doing it, great. What can we do to improve on it, too? Yeah. And it's, I think sometimes it's sort of the way the question gets asked, and to your point, too, it's, it, it may be. It may be there's a big concern here, and this is a red flag that boy we got to start to jump on this. Not that you know we certainly want to be very happy about the 77. I'm very concerned about the 23. Mm -hmm. and looking especially at the previous pages, um, but that 23 percent. If it's the I don't feel safe in school, or is it just we just didn't ask the question the right way? So it could be either one, and I don't want to. You know, well, we, don't, I, we don't want to. We don't want to start fires if we don't have to. Okay. But at the same time, I think just digging in, I'm glad to see that that's going to be a little yeah. piece. I'll be interested to see. Can you please keep us up to date yeah, as you get that? Yeah, definitely will. And I think even you know, as the principal was talking about the handbook, you know, mm -hmm. the, knowing that that sense of respect that when an administrator calls you down, you go down. When your parent calls you from upstairs to come downstairs <laughs> to talk to you, you walk down the stairs. When your you boss know. calls you to your office, so, you go down. You know, I think <laughs> if you know that it's expected to do that, you are going to feel safer. You know, maybe we'll see some changes. Okay. You know, I mean, but that was just popped out to me when he was talking. Thanks, so. Amy. You're welcome. 
Um, so now um, we're just going to go into the high school data. Um, which this was, I have to say, when, you know, when it came to the alcohol um, here in 2016, I mean 2006, when there was 67% of the kids were drinking, um, it was really kind of like, what are we going to do? We've got to do something. Um, and, you know, we really looked at that at the binge drinking and had to take into account, you know, as it says lifetime, we have many cultures in our community. And so what is the acceptability of that? Um, you know, where are they getting it when it says that they're getting it from home? Does that mean that they're just allowed to have an alcoholic beverage with their family for an occasion for, you know, cultural purposes? You know, and it doesn't go into detail for that. So that's also something that we learned we really needed to take into account with. Um, but now in 2016, we're seeing that 49% 40, of them are saying that, you know, they've drank in their lifetime. So once again, as talking about that prevention, we worked 10 years ago with those kids that are now answering that question, which to me that is like, shows complete success that we've been doing it and they're, make, they're making those decisions. <laughs> um, and we see that pretty much across the trend for all of the substances. Um, marijuana um, is a, you know, we did see a little bit of an increase in 2014, taking into account that that was when everybody thought that decriminalization meant that they could do it whenever they wanted. Um, but I think now as the trend, you know, they're seeing it's, it's, a, it's a decrease. Um, we did add in the prescription drugs, which we have, you know, we've stayed steady at 8%. Um, and then, you know, we do, we have 3% with the heroin use. Um, and so, I mean, I think that is an area that, you know, obviously in my experience, I mean, we're doing a lot of work on um, the heroin use and knowing that, you know, there is 3% of the population, it's out of 908, you know, students in 2016, that, you know, it is, it is around, but it's not around a lot, you know, so we are doing measures to take care of that. Still 27 students. Yep. Yep. That's the number. Yep. That's 3%, that's still. It, it, I'm it's very happy that 97% is none. Right. That 3% still scares the life out of me. Yeah. That's still very scary. And I think it goes into a lot as you, you know, start to see the, um, you know, as we go into like the current trends of, you know, what are they doing right now? So looking at, you know, the binge drinking and, you know, the alcohol use and then the marijuana use and prescription drugs on a date, you know, within 30 days, we didn't, um, we had 4% that were using in, um, over the past 30 days of prescription drugs. And, you know, smoking cigarettes, we had 5%. Uh, they've done an unbelievable job of reducing the numbers in current cigarette smoking. Um, and th that question, which was one of the questions that we did get into, was that cigarette smoking, mm -hmm. there is another question that includes vaping, like electronic cigarettes and things like that. And it even goes into in the seventh and eighth grade is where are you buying them? Because that was another concept that we had talked about prior to the survey being administered. Because we really wanted to see where are they getting them? Um, and what can we do about that? So, um, so that is, you know, we're definitely seeing that, you know, they're still doing things, but we're on the path in the right way. Um, so this is the trends in bullying and cyberbullying in the high school. Um, and so we have the same thing that we did um, with bullying as a victim in the past 12 months, bullying victim on school property, and then we added in cyberbullying victim and then a bullying property um, perpetrator. So this is, you know, the trend data. We kind of, you know, we're pretty similar to where we've been all along. Um, a little bit definitely lower from, you know, as we're, the bullying victims has definitely <coughs> decreased from 26 to 20%. Um, our bullying on school property has decreased from 23 to 18%. Um, a little bit of a rise in the cyberbullying, which I think from 2006 to 2016, social media and all of that has changed a lot. So we definitely would see that. We are down from two years ago. Um, and then um, where it comes the bullying perpetrator, once again, that wasn't asked in 2006, but if you look at 2014, we're down to 10%. So 
from 12 percent so we're that, making strides in it that first bar is obviously that with the it, that's where we don't have the data the one that shows 100 percent. yeah okay yes yeah. okay. that's the na <laughs> got it okay. um so yeah they didn't ask that question about perpetrators back in 2004. Um, and then really just looking at, you know, the bullying across the region, you know, and the United States and Massachusetts and seeing, you know, where we were a place that asked about cyberbullying perpetrators, um, where Massachusetts and the United States did not ask that question about current perpetrators, you know, with cyberbullying. Um, and then for the victims and, you know, a bullying victim, they also didn't ask that currently, you know, within the last year, Massachusetts and nationally didn't ask those questions. So that's where those 100% are again. Um, so. Um, and then we really looked at the mental health piece of this um, coming from the high school. And so as we see you know this we did more on a grade <coughs> because i think that's the most important piece for us to look at is where are the kids getting so stressed out and i think we can see that it's lower from ninth grade to 12th grade they're all getting ready to go to college you know there's a lot of things that come up that make them stressed so you know at 44 percent, i think we would be able to say that we know some of the things that they're getting stressed about but that's an area we look into further um, and then this is, you know, was hurt or injured yourself on purpose. Um, and so this is, we see kind of a slight decline from ninth to 10th grade, goes up in 11th grade, back to a decline. Um, and it seems like that's kind of been, as we were looking at all the data, it seemed like it went from ninth grade, decline in 10th grade, a little bit higher in 11th grade, and back down in 12th grade. So you know, there's definitely trying to understand what that is, you know, um, and that's, you know, feeling a little bit sadder about themselves, more hopeless, um, and looking at, you know, made a plan um, about attempting suicide. So that was them, you know, looking for a plan and, you know, not following it out, but a, pl a plan to do that. Um, and there's been so many measures within the high school setting that we have done to, you know, really address that mental health piece um, for those students so that there are a lot of resources that are here for the like, students. Amy, can you clarify, I'm sorry if you said it, um, what time of year the survey is given? It's given in November. So last fall is when this was given? Right. Yeah. Hmm. And it's usually given at the same time every single year, mm -hmm. um, around November, the same time. And one of the things about, you know, I think we all say that, like, one of the questions we were talking about is like, do, do the kids lie? You know, just go A, B, C, A, B, C. And they, lit which is amazing that they go through each and every survey. So when they see that it looks like you did A, C, D, C, they pull that survey out and say, okay, we're not using this one, um, which is great, you know, because then we see that, it, that these are valid measures. And we, you can compare it where even though we are different, we're slightly, you know, like a regionally, we're not much, much higher, but we're not much, much lower. You know, everybody seems to be, you know, well, we seem to be the same with that. Um, we didn't put in social media data just because, and there is a lot of data in there, and one of the reasons um, I didn't put it in there is because we did the screenagers um, a little while ago and we had presented that data, um, but that is available. And I know that one of the things that, you know, we had found when we were doing it was the students' perceptions of how much their parents are monitoring their social media, and it was very, very low. You know, that the par they do mm -hmm. not believe the parents are, wa are monitoring their data. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was interesting, and we did present that right up there, and I think with the, if any of you got to see the screenagers, um, you know, it's just kind of eye-opening. It's a mother who's, you know, just struggling like all of us as parents with that, um, so. We didn't, there is that data available on there. If you know that was something that you wanted, we just didn't put that in there. But I think the most, you know, as much as we show this and we show kind of like <coughs> the areas that we need to really work on, I think, you know, and you'll hear from Lucy as she goes through some of her stuff, that there is so much being done um, just collaboratively to make a difference and to make these trends really go down as mm -hmm. over the years. So I'll turn it over to Lucy. Do you want to ask any other questions about Sorry. the data before we go through? Does anyone have no, questions on the, the data? That you've got all this data to begin with. It's really 
really shows you what's happening, what you guys are doing. I think it's great. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. There's, and it, this, the, the safety of our students is so important, right? So there's always room, going to be room for imp mm -hmm. improvement, but it's very promising to see that things are trending in the right direction, um, and that's a direct result of all the programs and initiatives that have been put into place and the collaboration that you talked about, yeah. not only with the schools, but with the police and um, And the Board else. of Health. I mean, they, they have been a huge, you know, proponent for, you know, Lisa and, you know, just doing the leadership and, you know, there's a lot of support out there that, you know, peop they everybody's just coming together and, you know, just like um, Mr. Kaplan had, Attorney Kaplan had said, you know, it is that collaboration. You know, they, they had had me in to talk about what can we do about the opioid epidemic because we're here, we know that this is happening, what can we do? And, you know, so it's nice to see that Milford is a family town. Everybody is together and really works, you know, in collaboration. It's unique so. so you know last I think I don't know if it was last fall or last spring we were here we were talking about our SEL grant so we had done our first year of just in initiatives and then now um, we have three years of implementation of all the things that we wanted to do with, with all the money that we got from the Metro West um, Health Foundation so this first year we have $40,000 that we wanted to spend and it's totally focused on SEL social emotional learning we have to target, because it's an early childhood grant, we have to target preschool through grade two to three. Um, we are allowed to use monies for higher grades as long as um, it's gonna benefit all of our students, which it does, because if we start early, then it's gonna benefit all of our students at you know, Woodland Middle and High School. So some of the things that we're doing right now, our two main focuses based on the Castle Report and based on some of this Metro West um, data that Amy talked about, we wanna really work on adult SEL and um, social emotional learning in our students. And when we talk about <laughs> SEL in adults, um, that means focusing on our, our faculty and staff and support staff and administrators and how we can make connections with all of our students and with each other. So things like feeling safe in a school building, I think um, you'll see that that data will become more positive because the students feel more safe because they have all of us. Um, so some of the things, Kevin, you can go to the next one. Um, some of the things that we're spending our money on. Um, second step, social skills curriculum. Preschool, I know you guys already knew that we had that at Shining Star Preschool. We purchased kits for every K, one and two teacher um, team at Brookside and Memorial. Um, the adjustment counselors at Brookside and Memorial are going in to kind of facilitate and then the teachers will take over. Mindfulness in the classroom, Lisa White, our wellness nurse and our SEL consultant is visiting every preschool grade two classroom twice to fil facilitate the practice of mindfulness. Um, building our kids success, early morning program for students at Brookside and Memorial. There's gonna be 20 kids in each group at Brookside and Memorial. Mm -hmm. And then a buddy bench at Brookside Elementary School. Um, Lisa has already purchased the bench. SEL will certainly reimburse her. Um, our adjustment counselor, Katie Lavin, is going to, with Lisa's help, will educate the students on the meaning of the bench. I'm sure you've all heard of a buddy bench. So it teaches empathy, fosters friendships, promotes <coughs> kindness. And then we're going to do a dedication um, to the memory of Jacqueline Gray. And that ceremony will happen in the spring. So you'll all be invited to that. Um, okay, that's, that's what we just said. Um, <laughs> So some of the, this, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I'm very excited about this and I've said this so many times, we're really happy that we have a parent advisory council for special education. We have a lot of parent involvement and one of the great things about having our parents involved is that they, they support us in everything that we do. Um, we've worked with the PAC to schedule some presentations. So um, Lisa's going to be doing mindfulness in the classroom. So she'll talk to all of anybody that's part of the advisory council and then all parents will advertise it so that any parent in the district that wants to come. So she'll be talking about that for our October meeting. Um, Dr. Robin Bradica, who is a school psychologist turned team chair at Stacy Middle School, she's going to be talking about diagnosis versus classification for students on IEPs and how you qualify for an IEP. Um, Jessica Minahan is author of the Behavior Code. She'll be coming around, I think, in January and then Rebecca McCall, who's a licensed mental health counselor, she also works at Community Impact, and um, she is now our full-time clinical care coordinator for 
Milford High School. She's going to talk about trauma-informed classrooms. So these are just some of the things that we have, um, and it's all based around mental health issues and social-emotional learning, which is, which is just awesome. Um, we had Pam Garamone. I don't know if any of you have ever seen, seen her. I'm, I know Lisa and Judy had gone to some of her workshops and loved her, so they told us about her, and we brought her in for our leadership retreat. Kevin loved her, I think, so um, we, we got the green light to bring her in to address the staff on the second day of school, and she was awesome. She and was exceptional. Yeah, <laughs> and exceptional, yes. Um, she addressed the, the Leadership Academy for Peter Boucher and all the athletes, um, but we've heard nothing but great things. She's, she's great, so we're going to bring her in again on December 8th for all of our support staff, so <coughs> secretaries, cafeteria workers, custodians, anybody that wants to see her. Um, so she's great she just talks about you know the science of happiness and being positive and how much of a, a positive effect that has on our students um, professional development so again with a lot of the money that we have a few a few of us are in a program for obtaining a certificate in positive psychology whatever we learn from that we will bring back to the district we have 12 teachers from Memorial and Brookside going to the Mindful Educator Essentials Program. Lisa, you, you already participated in that one? Yes, I did. It's a course I took. It was great. So they'll go to that. And then we have six teachers from Woodland going to Social Thinking Conference, which is awesome. Every time we send somebody to, for professional development, they come back and um, educate the rest of us. And then promoting positive culture. I know, as you know, just from all of the media attention that, you know, I think we're getting on all the positivity and all the great things that we're doing in school between Twitter and videos and cable TV and all that good stuff. Um, we're really trying to promote <coughs> positivity with um, you know, t-shirts that have Shine Strong for the Shine Set Preschool, this Fed department, we're getting our own. Um, and we have Seeds of Happiness that you all have at your desk. So if you, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Seeds of Happiness. Did I already give you one? No? Okay. So um, I thought I did just. Um, the Seeds of Happiness, um, Pam Garamone had given me one on the day that she came for our retreat, and basically, there's a cute little story on the back of it, but um, the purpose of it is it's a little seed, and it has a smile on it, and so you give it to somebody if you think that they need a smile or if they've made you smile. So we purchased a bunch of them, and we've been giving them out, and I, I don't know, I think it's been such a huge positive response when you give it to a student. Whether, we don't give them to the young kids because we're afraid of <laughs> choking them. <laughs> and we don't have <laughs> lead in them. But um, we've been giving them out to some of the teachers for the classroom to talk about it and how, how much you can make somebody's day and make that connection. We've gotten a great response from all of the high school kids. Um, you know, even our toughest customers, everybody likes a little play smile. And we, um, we've been giving them to the health teachers to talk about just being kind and making somebody's day. So we have a couple of things that we have planned for um, November and December <coughs> because it's a, a tough time of year for a lot of our students. That's when we see an increase in stress and depression, even in our teachers and all adults. So we have a few things planned like that will kind of go around the seeds of happiness. We have a lot of um, people that we want to have speak to our students. And rather than consulting out with people that we don't really know, we're hoping to get um, some of our own faculty and staff to address our students. I think that for all of us to make connections with our students is probably the most important thing that we can do. If we, um, if we just let them know that we care about them and that they have all of the resources, because we have phenomenal guidance counselors, adjustment counselors, school psychologists, and teachers I mean, everybody here, we do care, so I think as long as we let our students know that, um, then we're going to see better statistics as far as, you know, stress levels going down and the anxiety and depression all going down. So that's our goal. <coughs> and if I could just jump in and just add to that, it's really having a multiply or a kind of effect in schools. Uh, you know, you walk into each of our schools and it just feels more positive than it ever has. And it's, I think it's a credit to the work. Any questions for Lucy? No, just thank you, Lucy. I know it's. I did like my little smile. It was the first question I asked her when I walked in. I said, "Oh, are we getting gifts?" And you said, "Yes." <laughs> so, um, I, I, I would be interested. In fact, I'll, I'll have to go on and take a look. I've got about nine people at work. I need to hand those to. So that's actually it's great. I love it. I love that. They, you know, that um, this is what's going out. If so. you look on the website, they have they have videos about what it is, and then 
we had asked them for a bulk order for this project. It we're going to be doing at Stacy in the high school, but I can't tell you about it yet. Um, but because we ordered all of them, we're going to put our story on their website too, because we yeah. kind of told them about it. So I think that that's really that's um, excellent. You know, no, that's great fantastic. Our school. So thank it's all good. Thank you all. Thank you. I think you have yours right there. Is that? I have mine right here. Oh, all right. <laughs> it smiled. It made me smile even before I knew what it was. Kind of Thank you. Thank, all right, you thank you, ladies. Thanks for the yes, update. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kevin, you're up. Report of the superintendent of schools. Yeah, so good. Yeah. So I've got two agenda items. The first one's very quick. Um, I just want to give the committee an update on the Solect Solar um, project. And I'm pleased to announce that we've executed the contract with Solect. The process has begun and their engineering team has engaged in some preliminary work. Rob Quinn and his team has been in regular contact with the company and will continue to do so as the project moves forward. So we're kind of up and running with the program. All the contractual issues, or the majority of the con contractual issues and the um, logistical issues have been worked out. And um, I think you know we're moving forward. And some of the work won't start because there's some regulatory things that have to happen with, I believe, the electrical companies and some permitting that needs to take place. So we may not see actual panels going up for a little while. but. The project is underway. It's up there. Completion date. I'm sorry. No, I was going to ask the same question. You know, some of the, some uh, you know they have to get it done before the end of the calendar year. So I'm assuming I'm going to say December 31st. There you go. But um, it really depends on some of these regulatory steps because sometimes they take they're very brief and that pushes the project up. Sometimes it takes a little longer and obviously that pushes the project back. Thank you. Okay. And that was yeah that was just for me my question. I the the longest timeline that I was aware of that's sort of outside of their control. Um, you know, there, it sounds like they're certainly bustling along, you know, taking care of the pieces that they can control. The last piece is actually having the electric company come out and certify it and be able yep. to then flip the switch. I know that's sort of the timeline that's a little out of their control yep. once they get it up and going. So um, just keep us updated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably maybe November-ish yeah. when we actually have some, I think, some things moving at the building level. We'll do that. All right. The next thing is the Milford. Oh gosh, why is it coming up now? The, the, we've got it on this thing. The Milford Public School <laughs> yeah, Strategic <so> Plan. <laughs> I'm going to stay away from that. <laughs> so, a lot of um, what Lucy talked about is actually incorporated into the social emotional piece of the plan. And I had put the, um, the visual up on the screen, but it's in your packet. And we were. the we were very particular about the visual because we feel like social emotional learning really encompasses everything and everyone. So that's the broadest circle. Obviously equity and access is a core value for the Milford Public Schools. And then our two pieces around learning which is growth focused instruction and continuous learning. Um, we're going to share more information about these throughout the year in a variety of ways. And each of the four strategic focus areas are incorporated into each school's improvement plan. So I'm, I'm very excited to broadly share the strategic plan with the committee this evening. And if you can go to the second page, um, it basically gives each strategic focus area's definition. And if you go to the, we can actually go to the following page because it's just a, <laughs> and also the kind of the key indicators. And I'm going to read these out because I think it's important. Uh, growth focused instruction, classroom settings are learner centered and focus on growth for all students. In our, in our kind of key indicators here is we want to increase student engagement, set high expectations, and produce outcomes for all students. We want to focus on mathematics growth and achievement, and we want to ensure the Milford Public Schools recruits, selects, and supports the highest quality educators. And obviously with the best people, we're going to see better results. Uh, social emotional learning, and I know Lucy talked about a lot of this, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this tonight. But children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. And this is actually from CASEL, which is the group that came out and did our initial assessment. So again, as Lucy stated, we're trying to develop social emotional competence in faculty and staff, increase communication with families in the community, and build social and emotional skills and competencies in students. 
Equity and access. Equity in education is a measure of achievement, fairness, and opportunity. In order to make education accessible, all students need to have equal and equitable educational opportunities, regardless of their age, social class, gender, gender religion, heritage language, ethnic background, or physical and mental disabilities. And again, it's a focus on inclusion and inclusive practices, closing the gap in achievement and growth for all students, and increasing access to the most rigorous courses for all students. And finally, continuous learning, which is to further develop a culture and the supports required to instill a spirit of constant and continuous learning for all members of the Milford Public Schools community. Again, that's going to include ongoing and embedded professional development, creating support opportunities for collaboration, and provide opportunities for community and schools to collaborate and learn together. And for each of these, um, we basically kind of laid out some of the key areas even beneath the key indicators. And I'm going to ask Craig <coughs> to kind of jump in here <laughs> and talk about uh, what growth focused instruction means and looks sure. like. Um, so, for which is your next page? With our high, when we highlight growth focused instruction, what it looks like for administrators um, and classroom teachers and parents, really we're talking about assessments. Um, teachers, teachers are looking at assessments, giving assessments, and then sitting together and, and figuring out if, if whatever the instruction is, is is working really and then figuring out how can we help the kids that need the help and how can we support the kids that, that are ready to run. Um, further when you look into a classroom you don't see kids sitting down and just listening to a teacher. You see kids working in groups collaboratively um, in, in working on different projects, that's what we hope to see. Uh, what What's highlighted in this, um, curriculum mapping, so all of our, our teachers are right now looking at our curriculum maps and trying to build uh, understanding by design units. We're unpacking that. Um, we, we talked about selecting and hiring teachers and but more importantly supporting them with our mentoring program and we're trying to build out that second and third year of the, the mentoring program right now. Um, we talked about co-teaching, so how, how can we effectively use the two or three or uh, teachers that are in the room where one's not just sitting in the back, they're working back and forth. And it takes, a, it takes teamwork and it takes a lot of planning to do that well. Um, and then uh, Project Lead the Way is off and running right now, and it, it's off and running at, at the middle school, it's off and running at, at, Wood, at Woodland, and we're looking right now to, to in, increase that with the high school, too. So. <laughs> yeah, and one, th one thing I'll say is Craig and I had the opportunity um, this week to go to, um, to see the place-based education program, and they came in and presented last year, and we were at, uh, I don't know if I should tell the full story, <laughs> but we were, at, uh, we were at Echo Lake where the Charles River begins, and to see the students kind of hiking down the trail and actually seeing the reservoir. And Craig asked me a great question. He said, uh, Mr. Gopian, who's one of the teachers, was asking the students a number of questions about things they were seeing and things they had talked about in class. And Craig said to me, do you think they'll remember this more or less than just being in the classroom and having a conversation? And I mean, the answer is obvious. Mm -hmm. But you just saw like, a, like an, an excitement and um, an engagement that you just, um, like you, 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 it's different when they're out in the world kind of learning as opposed to in a classroom. We want to see more of those kinds of like really high engagement um, experiences across the board. And obviously everybody's not going to be out every day, you know, running around the greater Blackstone Valley because that's not realistic either. But we want to see kind of those engaging learner center practices across the board. Mm. And just picture a kid turning on his faucet when he gets home and saying, I saw where that water comes from, being able to explain it. Yeah. I, I think it's great. Um, for social emotional learning, I think Lucy hit on you know the, the, the vast majority of these. Um, one thing that we're going to talk about next week is exploring um, secondary start times. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Periello is going to come in and kind of do a little presentation on that. It's a conversation that's happening, you know, nationally as well as at the um, at the state level. And some school districts are starting to make some shifts. Um, there's there's a number of impacts related to that. It's nothing you can. It sounds simple to do by just switching a half an hour, but it impacts so many things from transportation mm -hmm. to athletics to teacher contracts to before and after school care for children. Um, so it's something that we're in the very early stages of exploring and I'm not sure whether it's a right thing or a wrong thing for the Milford community, but it's something we're going to look at. 
with that actually is we are heading into uh, 2018 with a teacher contract <coughs> negotiation. Be, I, I think the sooner we can get to that, especially if it does require something that's with regards to a collective bargaining agreement with the teacher contract, the timeliness of it will be important. Absolutely. Um, we may just try to add some language about flexibility of, of start and end time. Yeah, just, just uh, and I'm being not sure how conscious that would, of that yeah, is I'm that not process sure how that begins look, really in the next couple months. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the third one is equity and access. And again, it's a focus on inclusive practices, um, reviewing, exploring, and assessing levels and pathways at Stacy Middle School and Milford House High School, outreach to families to increase <coughs> engagement, differentiating and personalizing instruction, uh, strategies to improve attendance. And I know uh, Woodland and the high school are looking mm -hmm. at this very closely this, this year in particular. Um, increasing access to the most rigorous courses and programs at the secondary level. Lucy talked about the development and growth of the MPAC. We didn't have a special education parent advisory committee before at the end of last year when, when Lucy and her team started it. And I think it's really taken off. And then um, you, know, you know, using digital tools to kind of level the playing field as tools for learning. And Craig, if you want to jump in on the sure. continuous learning. Um, one of our biggest limitations with our, our teacher contract is the amount of time contractually that we have teachers <coughs> at the school. I mean, we have them, I think it's, it's one hour, one hour a month, and that's it. Um, so we have to kind of think outside the box and how we can keep that, keep professional learning going with teachers. And we do from time to time pull teachers out of classrooms um, and I think in the long run in the long run for us for teachers that's good obviously we we worry when teachers are out of classrooms however I think the return is um, is valuable um, one one of the things that we're doing is every other week on a Wednesday we're having Twitter chats uh, last night we had one we had I don't know 30 or so staff members from represented from every building which I think is huge we just started doing it and, and we're already at around 30 we had people from other <coughs> districts jumping in a couple of weeks before which was great um, but but really trying to get people outside of Milford too and talking to people in other districts and seeing how other districts tackle things uh, I'll talk about it later with the assistant principal groups uh, but Eventually, we want to get to a place where, where we're having teachers choose their own professional development. Um, we're not quite there yet, we, just because of the constraints of, of the contract. But eventually, we'd like to get teachers into a position where they could choose a track and be able to grab 15 to 30 PDPs just in professional development and, and then be all set for their recertification when it rolls around in five years. Um, so something to think about when we're talking about negotiations too. So the other, the other piece too is um, we, want, we want to create a culture where teachers feel comfortable taking, taking risks. Mm. And not the kind of risky behavior that the group before us <laughs> was, was addressing, but more like um, trying different things in the classroom. And I know um, it's, it's starting to take hold. Like some, there's a group of teachers that want to explore you know, flipping the instruction so they can do more engaging things on a consistent basis in the classroom. Um, there's, you know, again, the place-based education mm -hmm. piece. We're looking at um, bringing in, you know, early college courses so, so um, students who can kind of expand their learning at the high school level. Um, there's a lot of great things going on, but we really want to um, engender with the faculty that we're really going to support them. And we know that, you know, you're not going to bat a thousand when you try something new. And we, we, we'd rather have them take some of these risks and have a couple of them be not successful than not trying new things because you're worried that it's not going to work. And that's what we're trying to, you know, get all of our principals to buy into mm -hmm. and have that really, really, you know, fit in with the culture within the schools. And it's, and it's really going to be more reflective of society where things are moving very fast outside of the four walls of, of schools across the country. And we're not going to ever mirror that, but we want to get closer to that kind of um, spirit of kind of innovation and um, willingness to be, um, Experimental and some of the things that you're doing. So each of these, each of these um, areas, and I think you got a sense of the progression from Lucy's presentation for year one and year two and year three. I didn't want to give you a 250-page <coughs> PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but each of these is going to have work plans connected to it and some set goals and outcomes. So, um, and I think you saw some of that with, with Lucy's presentation. But just kind of picture that with each of these 
kind of indicators and sub-indicators of the work that's happening. Some will take place at the elementary level, some will take place at the high school, some are going to take place across the district. Okay. So, thank you, Joe. So, Kevin, um, thanks. Clearly, there's a lot of work that's been put into this. It's, it's certainly, you know, there's a lot of information that's behind that, and I can certainly appreciate that. Kind of goes back to what we talked about back in the spring when each of the principals was coming through and doing their school improvement plan mm -hmm. is the how do you know yep right so and you mentioned that there's going to be desired outcomes I, I guess my one of the things that i would like to see um is and the question i would propose on this is how are you going to know to your point i want to encourage the teachers to we want to encourage our all of our staff and our students for that matter to you know, take some calculated risks and, and you know, try some, try, use that creativity and, and try some different things. How are we going to measure what's working and what's not mm -hmm. as we go forward um, with these initiatives? Thinking about, again, connecting it back to those improvement plans. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not looking for you to answer this tonight. I, it is going to be something I'm going to ask for on a future uh, agenda, absolutely. which is what are the metrics every successful organization in the world has metrics mm -hmm. um, we give metrics to our students if you ask a student in june how was your school year they're going to hand you their report card there's something that's able to measure it and it's it's yes it's quantitative but it's also qualitative in, in nature there's numbers associated with it there's data that's approached to it so it's more than just well we feel like it's going better mm -hmm. yep. how yeah, do we yeah, actually so quantify point to point where are we starting what's our baseline where, what's our what's our aspirational endpoint or goal, if you will, not an endpoint, and what are the milestones that we're going to sort of check in along the way mm -hmm. to make sure that we're sort of staying on track, so that as we're encouraging our teachers, hey, go out and take those risks, try those new and creative things. Hey, we're going to keep checking in because we want to know because if it works, boy, we want to do it everywhere. But boy, if it's not working, all right, well, well, why is it not working? How do we know it's not working, and what can we maybe adjust? To give you some support to go out and try something else, uh, and that's that's really just that that's my ask on this. Going back to what we talked about, starting back in June, uh, really April and May with the school improvement plans, it, that's really going to be the next piece that that I would look for as a committee member as well as candidly as a as a parent mm -hmm. and a taxpayer in the town of Milford. Yep. And I would say just a quick response because I'm not going to obviously go point for point. No, nope. we don't have the time. And I wouldn't ask. And I'm not yeah. asking <laughs> tonight. Yeah. Um, some of this is going to be very easily easily quantified, yes. and some of it will be presented in a qualitative manner. And and, and that I can because understand. it's con more conducive to that. Correct. Yep. I just wanted to add, um, you know, to echo the amount of work that obviously went into this, and I think um, it's impressive. Each of the four quadrants that you've highlighted, it's hard to say that one is more important than the other because they're all so equally important in different ways. Um, but I will say how happy I am to see the work that Lucy and that team did with the social emotional work and to read that we're focusing on the adult community just as much as mm -hmm. the student community. Um, it, and in addition to that, the parent communication. I think we, we have <coughs> to keep letting our families know the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, what's, go what's going on, what's going on in your children's educational world, um, in your use of Twitter, you know, it, it's very impressive, but coming from the classrooms also, that's, it's important. So I'm happy to see that on here. And I think in terms of the adults that work with our children, um, a lot of our kids come, and you all know this, but they come with issues that are not apparent to the naked eye. And mm -hmm. when you're out there on a duty and you're on the recess field or you're running something and you see a child who's not doing what is expected and somebody raises their voice at them, and this happened just recently in my school, mm -hmm. and because someone didn't know, because the child presented as obstinate or not cooperative but really it was based on something that you would hope have hoped the adult would have understood that kids are coming to us with so many different challenges so I think really imparting that and having our faculty really stop for a minute and think you know what what else might be going on here besides who's trying to be difficult or um, mm -hmm. or challenging um, I like that they're getting the tools I, I think Jessica Minahan is a great Resource. Yeah, she's fantastic. Um, so I, I think all of that work to give our staff the tools, even helping them understand kids with behavior plans and why does this kid get a break and why does this kid mm. get a get a reward and it, it's very very challenging even for teachers who have the best um, motives and, and the best intentions. Sometimes these are hard jobs. So I'm really glad we're bringing in our own experts and outside experts to to help mm. with that. I think it's it's critically important. So thank you. 
any other questions or comments? You did it. Did a great job with uh, the strategic plan, Kevin. Um, it, c can you talk a little bit about um, what this plan does? So, in, in other words, we, we're essentially establishing the, the vision and the areas of focus for the next three years, mm -hmm. right? And then you, you mentioned the, the different work plans for each of these areas of focus, and ultimately, this is going to drive the your annual goals. It's going to drive right. the school improvement plans. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's also going to drive the budget process, right? Because we want everything tied into this mm -hmm. strategic plan that you, you've outlined here. And, and ultimately, it's really to improve. Like, we have a product at the end of 13 years of education, which is our graduates. And we want to make sure that they're heading, you know, whether it's either to college, whether it's a four-year or two-year school, to employment, to the military. We want them to be as prepared as possible to be successful once they walk out the doors in the local public schools. And that's what it really all culminates into. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> so uh, move on to the next agenda item. Um, actually, Craig, you're, you're up. Report Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I basically, the two things I wanted to talk about today kind of actually feed from, from what you just heard from about uh, the administrative walks. So administrative walks are when basically uh, the central office staff Go to each of the each of the school buildings, meet with the principal, assistant principals, and we kind of talk about um, what we want to see, and we walk around into to different classrooms. The biggest thing that we're doing this year is, is like we said, talking about student engagement. So we talk it all, we talk it through with the principals and assistant principals what student engagement is, and then we go on our learning walk and, and see where what areas, what classrooms are we seeing it, and what does it look like. Um, and basically the point of it is to get on the same page, to see if it's happening, um, observe it with our own eyes, and uh, make sure that, that principals and assistant principals are following up with teachers when it is happening. And if it isn't, find out what's going on. So um, we've, so far we've done, we do two a week. We do, we take a morning and, and we've done the high school, the middle school, Woodland, and Shining Star. Tomorrow we have Brookside and Memorial, and then we'll just continue on for the rest of the year that way. Um, I don't know if anybody has questions about that. But I think it's important to note that we're in every school every yep. month as a team walking into classrooms and having discussions about practice. Every week too, right? Just not about every school, not every school, but but I mean that's only obviously we're in the schools a lot more than just those two times, um, and I think. Fortunate, I'm fortunate enough to have some actually some observations and evaluations myself this year, and and working with teachers, um, and really trying to push some of those things with teachers and, and help them feel, trust us that we we want them to try to go outside the box and, and even fail forward. It's fine, but we have to build that through relationships, I guess. Um, all right. So the second thing. Assistant, <coughs> assistant principal professional development. It's, it's a group that's really, in my opinion, is neglected um, and, and underrated. I think assistant principals have the ability to, to drive a lot of change within a school. And unfortunately, the role of an assistant principal, uh, <coughs> people look at an assistant principal as just a disciplinarian. And it's, it's unfortunate because when people get into those positions, that's not what they got those positions for. They, they have a lot of expertise that we don't take advantage of. So I'm really trying to help the assistant principals get out in front more with, th with things beyond discipline. So one of the things that we've talked about is instructional leadership. So as assistant principals, how can, how can the assistant principals get together with teachers and lead some of these professional learning communities how can you change the narrative of what an assistant principal's job actually is uh, so that the public doesn't see them as just a disciplinarian. They're, they're seen as an instructional leader, like they are. Um, and part of those meetings that we had, we, we look at observations together and we try to calibrate, um, you know, what, what does effective instruction look like? But what does it look like in a high school versus a middle school versus an elementary school? And is it all that much different? Does it still have the same components? It should, but, 
of what are you looking at? And, and it should be that if, it's, if we calibrate it correctly, students going from one building to the next should know what to expect when they walk into a classroom. And there shouldn't be a, a whole lot of change when they go from one building to the other. Um, one of the other things that we do is, is we meet regionally. So Maureen Cohen, who's uh, from Menden Up and also assistant superintendent, her and I lead this group regionally, which Kevin and, and Maureen started and I kind of took over. And we've she says she claims it's a big upgrade. I disagree. <laughs> Well, if you look at the metrics, <laughs> the amount of that's assist, a great answer, the Craig. Amount of I like that answer. Principles that are now in it is up to somewhere between forty and fifty, <laughs> which is is enormous. So, we only had two when I was there. So <laughs> no, really. So the word is we're getting the word out, and, and we're getting assistant principals to come together and, and talk to each other, um, and we're exploring doing learning walks within each other's buildings which is, it's kind of difficult to do with schedule-wise. But some of the things that we're talking about is uh, school culture and how do, how do different um, towns deal with school culture, how do different assistant principals deal with it. Um, what, does, what does student engagement look like in your school versus your school? Uh, and, and really coaching teachers. So those are the conversations that we're having regionally. And I, um, our first one is coming up uh, next week, so looking forward to it. That's, good. That's okay. great, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any, it, from those meetings, are you finding any or learning any best practices as far oh, definitely. as moving from that um, disciplinarian role to more of the instructional leader? Like, are there well, any districts that are doing that successfully? Um, it's, it's a struggle for all assistant principals, honestly. Um, there are different ways you can, but uh, like I said, unfortunately, one of the things that we have going against going against us is our contract. You know, in other places, the amount of time that they have after school with teachers, assistant principals could do all kinds of things with, with teachers because the teachers have to stay maybe once a week versus once a month, which is what we have. Um, so in some places, they do it better than others just because they have the time to do it. That's all. Any other questions for Craig? Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Well, <coughs> Kathy? Uh, first, approval of warrant for the committee's approval this evening. I have nine warrants, and the first warrant is in the amount of $222,665.08. I have a motion to approve. Motion from Scott, seconded by Jen. All in favor? The second warrant is in the amount of $17,429.07. Motion from Jen, seconded by Jim. All in favor? The third warrant is in the amount of $32,662.19. Motion from Joe, seconded by Jim. All in favor? Uh, the next warrant is in the amount of $341,316.92. Motion from Jim, seconded by Scott. All in favor? The next warrant is in the amount of $345,712.62. Motion from Jen, seconded by Joe. All in favor? The next warrant is in the amount of $24,853.46. Motion from Scott, seconded by Joe. All in favor? The next warrant is in the amount of $7,038.85. Motion from Jim, seconded by Jen. All in favor? The next warrant is in the amount of $1,767.54. Motion from Joe, seconded by Jen. All in favor? And the last warrant is in the amount of $998,016. Motion by Jim, seconded by Scott. All in favor? The committee has a um, FY18 budget update. We also have a personnel update, all new hires and appointments from our previous meeting. No vote is required. I do have an out-of-state field trip for the hotel and hospitality group who would like to travel to um, Johnson and Wales in, in Rhode Island on um, October 19th. It is out-of-state and does require a vote. Motion by <coughs> Scott, seconded by Jim. All in favor? And we have Dr. Joseph, who would like to travel um, 
two trips out of state the information <coughs> um, for you is provided in the packet one trip is in October to go to um, the focus group for uh, web-based security for one-to-one -one environments and that would cost approximately two hundred dollars for him to travel we have a motion from Jen seconded by Jim all in favor in the second out-of-state travel request that he would have for you is to travel on October 26th to the 27th uh, that does come with a potential cost of two hundred dollars he is out of district and therefore would require a school committee vote okay, motion from Joe seconded by Jim all in favor and then superintendent yep. Yeah, McIntyre? so before I do that, um, Matt's, I think, done, Dr. Joseph has done a great job because he's getting involved in a lot of national groups, and I think it's bringing a lot of resources to the district, and these types of programs, um, <coughs> you know, kind of, you know, to, to Craig's program with the assistant principals, he's, he's kind of doing it on a national scale. We can practically do that with assistant principals, but, you know, I, I commend Dr. Joseph for getting engaged in these things. Um, I've been invited to attend the School Research Nexus Elite Symposium in Orange County, California, from October 10th to the 13th. Um, this is a valuable professional development experience that will include presentations from former National Secretaries of Education, thought leaders in education, respected academics. The appealing thing for this particular program for me is it's a really small setting. I think it's 50 or 60 superintendents from across the country that get together. And you're actually like, I think at one point I'm sitting at the table with a former Secretary of Education. So I think it's a good opportunity to, to really engage with some top level people. What's the cost associated with it? Uh, just it's, it's going to end up just being a few hundred dollars. Okay. So yeah. we have to vote on that. Yes. yes. As well. All right. Motion from Scott, seconded by Joe. All in favor. And then the gifts. And then we do have some gifts tonight. Um, let's see here. Right, so the the first gift is extremely generous gift of $5,407, um, and that's from the, the Allen Family Charitable Trust. I um, want to recognize Mr. Robert Allen and Mrs. Karen Allen for this grant, uh, and the, it will go towards the Brookside Foundations, found, Foundations or Foundations? <laughs> that's I think Foundations. Foundations, yes. Phonics for Grade 2. Yes. Mm. That's, well, that's, a, that's a literacy program. <laughs> yep might need to participate. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have a, a motion to accept the gift? Motion from Joe, seconded by Jen. All in favor? The next gift is from um, Harvard Pilgrim Health uh, on behalf of Gloria Souza for $500, and this <coughs> gift is uh, being made to the class of 2018. So motion, motion from Scott, seconded by Jim. All in favor? Another very generous gift. Thank you. Uh, the next gift we have is for $200 from the Su Sergeant John Powers Post 59 for girls softball. A motion to accept. A motion from Jen, seconded by Joe. All in favor? Thank you to Post 59. Uh, the next gift we have is for $25 from Lisa Duarte uh, for Jackie's Boutique. A motion to accept. A motion from Jim, seconded by Jen. All in favor? Again, very generous gift from Lisa. And then we have another gift uh, for Jackie's Boutique of, of $20 $25 from Stephen and Lori Weber as well, um, from Stephen and Lori Weber. We have a motion to accept, motion from Joe, seconded by Jim. All in favor? Thank you to Stephen and, and Lori, and we'll send some thank you notes out to everyone as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's all the gifts. And the next agenda item is the, the subcommittee update. So the first subcommittee update that we have is for the uh, policy meeting. So uh, we did meet <coughs> on that. Um, we did have a meeting. We were, we began to, uh, the first thing we did was we had Dr. Joseph actually came in going through the, um, really the technology use program uh, 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 policy, starting to just, He's, he's really looking to sort of marry two policies and, and create some additions that go along with that. Um, we've asked that he go back and just sort of redline and make the make it a little clearer for what the what the changes are and where the impacts are. Um, just very preliminary conversations around that, that um, on that particular one. The second one was uh, just continuing on the religious observance policy as we've talked about. 
Um, really, the focus in the conversation was around um, going out and seeking feedback out from the from um, a couple of different focus groups. Um, I can really share, Scott, yep. if you don't and mind. I think you've got an update um, on that. Yeah. So uh, we asked for we solicited feedback from our faculty, and we got some written feedback. We also held a um, forum, and two kind of themes emerged from the teachers. Um, one was they were just looking for more clarification around it. And two, um, they wanted to have school-based conversations as well with their building principals. So we're gonna be scheduling the school-based conversations I think over the next couple weeks. And we're gonna work based on those conversations and clarifying some of the questions that, that are out there. But it was very good, very productive conversation. Um, and you know, I thought the feedback from the teachers was great as well. Good. So more work to be done there. We definitely want to, um, the, certainly the, a big focus of the conversation that happened during that meeting was also um, the interest in making sure we do get the feedback and we do our due diligence on it, but also moving swiftly, knowing that um, as much as it's, it was you know, certainly a beautiful, nice, warm day and we've had some really nice warm weather, the holidays are very, rep very rapidly approaching. So uh, we want to be able to, make, be able to give that clarity and, and if, uh, what, if any, adjustments need to be made to that policy are going to be made and, and able to be rolled out and communicated very clearly in advance of the upcoming holiday season. John, I don't know if there's anything else that we missed on that. No, I think that. that covers it. Okay. So the, the next policy meeting is next, is it next week or is it the Next Thursday. The next okay. next yeah, Thursday. Yep, next Thursday. Oh, it is next week, yeah. Yep, so our next one is Thursday, so hopefully we'll be able to dig into the, some of the data that you've already got, <laughs> some of those responses, get some more information, be able to look at some of the details on that, and yep. then Absolutely. go forward from there. And yep. is the, um, the, the school-based meetings? Uh, I don't think we'll get them board? done by that point, but I think um, probably, I think some of them will may be done by that point, but definitely the week after. Okay. So we may need to add another meeting on before the the second October school committee meeting, we need we may need to add another policy meeting then, just so that we can start to move quick. Because otherwise, after that, it's November. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be great if we can get this wrapped up by that first meeting in November. Yep. So great. Yes, we might want to just clarify if the b meetings with building principals are just to kind of solidify understanding of policy, and if it's, that's it, the case, it's kinda, then it, no, it's two things. One, okay. they want to just kind of have because. The needs of the high school and the concerns yeah. of the high school are very different than they are at the K-2 mm -hmm. schools, for right. example. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be, I think, a very small group and a very brief conversation, a briefer conversation, I think, more at the secondary level, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a little more in-depth at the elementary level. So I think it's some clarification. I think it's just what some of the expectations are and mm -hmm. coming to kind of a common understanding. Okay. But would you anticipate, I guess my hope would be... I think by the end of October, like, probably if we schedule the meeting by the end of October, maybe to replace our November meeting, mm -hmm. we could probably wrap it up, I'm assuming. It, it sounds to me like the direction we're going is that the existing policy, I, I haven't heard you say there have been incredible objections to the current policy, but maybe I'm hearing more I think, I think the I think it's more around implementation, implementation and communication, I would say, mm -hmm. are, the, are the bigger areas of concern rather than the policy itself. Got it. Thank you. Because the vast majority of the policy is around... Um, observance and mm -hmm. um, personal expression and, and those types of issues mm -hmm. um, a lot of the conversation is just about like communicating clearly right. in terms of expectations mm -hmm. yeah. Which makes sense. Okay. so we may have an opportunity in the language to clean that up based on that too and just create greater greater clarity <coughs> great all right uh, Scott you want to cover the budget sure. policy as well so um, yeah there were really kind of two focuses one was um, really just around uh, the upcoming town meeting at the end of October um, we have an opportunity to, as we've discussed during our budget conversations in um, at the end of last school year. So in, uh, in it was really around going to town meeting for the warrant um, to seek funding for the additional Chromebooks to cover <coughs> grades 10, through, uh, 10, 11, and 12. Um, this is the second half of the funding. The dollar amount we're, see we're looking to seek and be able to add on to that warrant is going to be approximately 300000 I think that was actually the dollar amount we're going for. Uh, Dr. Joseph did come back and said that's that's going to be within the confines. There'll be, uh, that will give us enough with, you know, uh, get pretty much right on target with what the cost would be. It was really just a conversation we're going forward with that piece. Um, the other piece was uh, there was a question that was brought up on a, as an agenda item. Uh, there was a question brought up by uh, by John around um, asking for greater clarification on grant money um, and the fun what was going on. That there was a question with regards to was there grant money that was being returned or being you know not spent or not 
not going through. So um, I wasn't sure if I, I wasn't sure if we had an update on that, Kathy, on that. Uh, that was something that John had asked Kathy very specifically to do some research. I think on. we're going to respond to that at the next budget subcommittee and just have I, the subcommittee kind of. I mean, do you want to sure. respond? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I did do some research on that. The um, school department received 2.3 million, approximately 2.3 million in uh, grant funding, state and federal. We had approximately 20 grants, 20 grant writers that manage the grants. We um, are sending approximately $8,500 back out of the $2.3 million. 7800 of that, one of the grant writers uh, requested to use those funds in the Department of Ed said that it wouldn't be appropriate. We, the grant funds were essentially locked into that grant, li grant line item. So therefore, we couldn't move those funds. So that leaves approximately $1,000 out of the $2.3 million that we'll be returning. And that's multiple, I just have to say, that's multiple grant writers and um, liaisons that manage these grants. And they do a fantastic job with those grants. And they work very hard to use all of the funds and um, we're lucky to have them. They work really hard. We do send monthly updates and monitor the grants, but ultimately they're responsible for them and they do great work. Great. That was, that was for me my question is, is are we sending updates to let them know where they are with the grant writers so that way? Um, no, it's a thousand dollars. Is that you said? Is that spread across multiple grants, or is it's, that it's it's multiple grants? Six hundred dollars of the thousand was the um, Perkins grant, which was essentially managed by Carrie and Mark. And, and, that, and that's something that we might want to discuss too, either at, at the budget subcommittee level or when we go through the budget process. But maybe exploring um, whether or not it, it makes sense to have to have a grant writer for the district, someone that's solely focused on exploring what grants are available and submitting the, the grants. And, and maybe that's something we can work with the town as well, because the town can certainly benefit from grants on their side. Um, so I think that's a position that could potentially pay for itself if you had that. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's been writing for the last <laughs> month. I don't know. How many grants have you written in the last <laughs> month? Right. Yeah, Craig's been a rainmaker. Yeah. yeah. That's good. He got word today on one, right. I believe, right? Title four. Um, and then the last piece was just that uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, you had a addition that you were looking to make or a change that you were looking, uh, in addition you were looking to have for the budget subcommittee. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I'll get to that in, in, in a minute. I think the other thing we, we, we talked about as well um, was that we're just waiting on the, the FinCom to make their Yeah, our, our next scheduled meeting, yep. And and so it's just we're, we're, we're waiting on feedback from, uh, they're going through their reappointments of their sort of their reorganization like we do every April. Mm -hmm. They're going through some of that right now where it's they're appointing their different subcommittees right now. And, and so we're just wait, awaiting their new appointments of their subcommittees as we know they've had some changes in some of their members. Um, as soon as they have their education subcommittee set up, we'll be looking to schedule another meeting with them. All right, thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. um, so then the other point that Scott made, um, we, we, we did have a committee member, Jim, who had expressed some, some interest in serving on the, the budget subcommittee. Um, and so I just wanted to um, notify the committee that I'm going to be appointing him to the budget subcommittee as well. So Jim will serve with, with Scott and John. Okay. Bring your calculator. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then marketing communications. Jim, you want to give us a quick update yeah, sure, on that? Yeah, uh, just. <laughs> <laughs> He'd love to. I'd love to. Uh, actually, so the two main takeaways from the last meeting were the um, ClearGov Clear site. Um, identifying you know strong uses for that how we were going to identify building a dashboard what we were going to use for um, data points how we were going to communicate them what we were going to communicate uh, Kevin has been a um, has been on record numerous times as saying that you know we, we really want to have a tailored message <coughs> um, we don't want to throw a ton of you know municipal data up there or district based data up there without a strong narrative behind it so that we can um, you know, kind of really kind of shape and, and scope what's going on in the district in a positive way. Um, so that that's an ongoing communication and ongoing dialogue. Um, the second 
takeaway from the meeting was the um, I Love Milford Public Schools uh, campaign uh, that we're going to run. This again, this is Kevin is spearheading this. Um, this is a uh, you know kind of a video, um, almost montage with a lot of kind of quick hits of the district, a lot of uh, students, faculty, um, legacy uh, graduates, uh, some celebrity, if you will. Uh, but it really focuses on um, all of the positive things going on in the district, uh, both now, things in the past that are um, traditional in some sense, and then, you know, kind of a look forward. So we're looking to be able to socialize that, um, you know, electronically or, you know, from a video perspective. So uh, we, we focused on, you know, whether that was going to be made in-house or uh, externally through Milford TV. We were going to... <laughs> um, but we really feel like we have the talent and the resources in-house to probably facilitate that. So so that's going to be very interesting when it's done. It'll be kind of in the vein of the lip dub type of mm -hmm. approach. Um, but something that we wanted to do, um, and we, we definitely want to try to, to um, I guess, put more visual advertising into place. So. Sounds great. Just okay. a quick question on that. Jim, sure. on, um, with homecoming uh, coming up on November 7th, uh, I'm sorry. October 13th. Um, any thought to, I'm not sure with what the planning looks like yet for homecoming. I know it's coming up in a few weeks. Uh, I know in the past we've done like sort of almost like a trade show kind of like bo booths and different things and different stuff going on. Any thought to even doing like I Love Milford Public Schools, like a table or something like that, even just something like that? Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, you know, Kev, we should probably, uh, we could take that offline and see what we can pull for resources together to have some type of a footprint or presence yeah, there for that. That'd be great. Yep. You know, one of the things I like to do again, and we did last year for the home opener for football, was to, to drive, um, you know, a, a media commercial that was audio. You know, I had a lot of the, I had the captains over to my studio. We did a, a voiceover and we put their traditional, you know, Zeppelin, the outro part of uh, Stairway to Heaven, which, you know, has been used for decades, <coughs> you know, as Milford tradition. So uh, we kept going. And uh, so I'd like to do that again this year so that, you know, we've got a very strong connection with MRC as well as Milford TV. And I know Ray had been, um, Ray Osher had been, you know, very supportive last year in playing it to support uh, attendance at the homecoming. So I think we want to try to do something like that again this year. That's great. And the, the other thing that they're doing, as um, Nathan pointed out, is recognizing the class of 1987. So yeah. that will draw in alumni mm -hmm. um, to the homecoming. And then they also get the youth league heavily involved yep. throughout that entire day as well. So you get the, the younger kids and their families there. Um, and then, of course, Carla and the, the food are oh. always a, a big hit. So the event itself does You could have Carla and the food positive thing it, the just in the middle of the field right. alone <laughs> and you're going to draw people. But yep. one yeah. of the things we did last year, too, to help with the um, – you know, with the school spirit and the, the and kind of the branding from the lower level up was, particularly in football, because, I mean, we just have the luxury of having so many kids, you know, at your disposal there, was to have a team run in every year before varsity came in. You know, so one year it was, I mean, I'm, you know, one game it was fifth grade, one game it was sixth grade, one game it was seventh. Um, Joe, you must have seen that a million times last year. So I, I love that. I think that's a great approach to, you know, helping to build the brand of the district from, you know, some of the lower grades up. And we've been talking with Pete about doing similar activities, you know, amongst several other, um, you know, sports. So it's not just, you know, kind of unilateral. Um, and then also to broaden that even a little, I've been working with Nadine to look for ways to showcase um, the, you know, the more of the uh, music and arts perspective by actually, you know, again, bringing in Milford TV and trying to do showcases of smaller you know segments quartets or maybe coming in and doing more spot recording so that we can air a lot of that uh, so people that you know that don't have kids in the district but still should see and recognize the cultural uh, significance to what we're building here from a, from a um, you know a extracurricular perspective um, can see what we have and what the kids have accomplished so those are all those are all kind of things that are in play at the moment and then just to add on the, the, the Claire Gov comment, um, you know, I think that having that data available at our fingertips and being able to create some of those dashboards are going to help us measure uh, some of the things associated mm -hmm. with the strategic plan and, and some of the goals yeah. that are out, outlined. So Absolutely. Um, the hope is that we, we can get that to be our, our dashboard to monitor the progress 
going forward. And, and obviously, Josh has got a lot of great ideas as well. He's um, been fantastic all the way through. It's yeah. been awesome. Great. Thank so. you. Thanks. All right, uh, future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? Um, the one I mentioned earlier around the path lighting. Yep, and I've got that. Um, and then actually, I just, uh, if it would, uh, if the community would, would be interested, um, obviously Sunday is October 1st. Um, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I was wondering if the, if, uh, the committee would be interested in if we could get, um, we've done this in the past where we'll do, we'll get ribbons that we would wear during meetings to support different things that would coming up with, with it being Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We've had certainly um, our community and our, our school community has not been immune to that. Um, I just ask if we can, if there's a way that we yeah, can get and access and, and get some pink ribbons and if we do. And I can say Judy Dagnese is running a bunch of, through the wellness committee, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this because I don't have it in front of me, but it's like a mammogram rama. Okay. And there's two other. <laughs> I don't know about that. There's, Good there's, job. There's two other. There's two I'm not other, sure I'm signing up for that. <laughs> That There's two other events connected to it too for um, the month, and I'll, and I'll bring that to with the, for the next meeting. I'll yeah. share that with but if, we, if there's a way that we could get, yeah, I, I know like we've had some of the groups and stuff like that. Presents got, us with ribbons for that yeah, month. that would be great if we yep. can, and that way, just for our meetings yeah. in October, wear them during meetings. That that's, I can, I can that's check my one on that. Yep, that's easy. Great. Any other? I just want to add one thing. Um, it's more of a recognition, but um, you reminded me with the football. Um, we had the Eagle Scout, a prospective Eagle Scout, who spent a lot of time this summer working on the ticket booth oh, for yeah, the, the cool high school field, mm -hmm. and it would be great. I'm, I'm not sure if it's completely done at this point, but it would be great if we could bring him in. And Absolutely. There are a lot of adults and other scouts that were there supporting him. Yeah, they worked really hard. I, I don't think it's completely done, but it's, it looks awesome. It does yeah, look awesome. I mean, what a great idea was, and what a, just a great addition. So yeah, so we'll, we'll bring him in when he, um, yeah. when he completes the project. And Perfect. We'll That's great. That's a great idea. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Any old business? Business. We, have, we don't have executive session tonight, right? No. All right, so no, no executive session. I, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion from Jim, seconded by Joe. All in favor? All right. Good night.